Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another exciting Jim Cornette experience. Today on the program, Dissension in the Bloodline. They're calling the cops over AEW television, and we're going to have an in-depth discussion on my ass. And you, the listener, will decide which is more interesting. And joining me, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you. He's a podcasting proctologist. He gets to the bottom of it all. The great Brian Last, everybody. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again. You know, I am quite proud of my interview ability. I think I am probably the best interviewer out there. However, one subject I have no interest in learning about is the bottom of your ass, whatever it is you said there at the top of the show. Well, let's talk about my colon. <laughs> let's just go ahead and, and start. Why not? Yeah. Why not get this? Uh, this is the, the happy talk portion of the program, folks. It's the way most wrestling shows begin. Let's talk about the asshole. Well, yeah, it's, I know it's a standard opening for one of the hosts to talk about their colonic experiences of the fucking week, but it's been basically, since we spoke on your program, the drive through which some people have likened to a colonic experience, um, this... It's basically all that's taken up by my fucking time here over the past couple of days. I had I had the colonoscopy. It's the first time in years that I've paid somebody to stick something up my ass. And I'll tell you, this was probably... How many years? How many years? I'm, oh, several. <laughs> and, well, now I did have the... <laughs> What I, I I had the last colonoscopy. I guess it's been ten years ago now. I had my first one. See, it was an anniversary. Right? You do these things on a regular. As you get older, you do things like this with more frequency. The next but, the next one's buy one get one free. I they, well, exactly. I've got a card now. They they stamped with the. Uh, but anyway, but no, it it you know it, you got to take care of yourself when you get to a certain age. So anyway, I tell you, my doctor, Doctor Vinny Boombots, I talked to him on the phone the other day. He's trying to take care of himself, but he's he's old and sick and tired. But nevertheless, <laughs> he he had he had he had to quit uh, he had to quit doctoring because of illness and fatigue. People were sick and tired of him. Anyway, I uh, thank you, King. We'll talk about you later on. This is my colonic story. <laughs> so. The last test that I am scheduled for in my annual battery of examinations to find out what the fuck might be medically wrong with me, they can find nothing, and I know that's that can't be true, so I th they're just they're not looking in the right place, although they pretty much covered every square inch now. Um, this was the last test I had to discover if there's anything seriously wrong with me, right? So, the, as if that's in question. Well, I'm talking about physically, with health wise, and we're not even talking about a mental evaluation. And I do have certain mechanical issues from my years of taking bumps, but I'm talking about, you know, gross type of shit you see on the fucking Discovery Channel, a shit that I don't want, don't want to be a part of. But it, they say on these things that the preparation is worse than the than the experience, right? Well, I don't know about that. I don't. I wasn't a fan of either one. But if you start at the, it, it was scheduled for Thursday morning. So Tuesday evening, my evening meal is the last time I can have any solid food. And and of course now I'm freaking out about you know I'm about medical shit. So I'm not. Well, I'm thinking well. I'm not going to have a big beef o Brady's blowout with the one pound OMG burger with six slices of bacon like I'd like to in case this is my last meal because they're going to they're going to put me under. They're going to put me to sleep. And but at the same time, then I'm thinking, well, fuck that. That's a half of a fucking side of beef. That'll take days to travel through my no matter what kind of force is applied to it or external situation comes the following day so I did, i'm gonna eat light i had a ham and cheese sandwich which was not a a a fulfilling final meal so i'm thinking they better take care of me i can't go out this way like a fucking ham and cheeser so then wednesday i'm trying to conduct my normal business i've got uh merchandise to sign for cornet's collectibles so hotchkiss can get that out to the people and my contractor mr wright 
He's out there. He's working. They're working on some stuff. I'm trying to monitor that. But at 1 o'clock on Wednesday, I've, I can only have liquid all day, but I'm supposed to take these laxative pills. It's over-the-counter shit, right? They said they sent me a list of shit to buy, and Stace actually went out and got it, you know, because I was probably not going to do that. And she made me, or she made me take it by going out and buying it. Anyway, so I look into, and it on the directions, it says take two of these pills with eight ounces of water, and, you know, that, that's what you're supposed to do. Well, the instructions that the doctor sent me said take four of these with eight ounces of water. I'm like, oh, they're really going to blow me out, right? So I take four, four of those and eight ounces of water and go on about, I'm signing books and stuff and I'm back and forth. And after a couple hours, I don't feel it. I'm like, what the fuck kind of weak ass shit is this? Right. This ain't going to be no big deal. I haven't, haven't felt a rumble or a, a, a fart coming on or anything. And then at four o'clock, I'm supposed to, now the problem has become I'm supposed to start drinking this other shit. And Brian, you know I'm I'm addicted to the Sprite Zero. I got the I got the Sprite Monkey on my back. You've and I don't You've established you don't even drink water. You only drink we, Sprite well, Zero. Well, no, cuz water is just unflavored Sprite Zero. But uh but I like a clear I like a clear refreshing beverage. Hold up. Oh, a clear. No one needs to hear that refreshing carbonated beverage with a hint of lemon and lime. I don't drink this, this Gatorade Powerade, all these aid stuff. It's like flat cat piss flavored with fucking fruit rinds. Right. But, and there's no carbonation and there ain't no, there ain't no goodness in there, but what I'm supposed to do and is take, 64 ounces and Stace got me the lemon lime because I'm not supposed to have anything red. That could look like I'm bleeding out apparently from an internal camera. I guess the people that run the curse of Oak Island are going to be at the camera. They're going to be seeing what's going on. And they're at the, when they cored me to the depth of 93 feet and found the evidence of the mine shaft, that's what anyway. So 64 ounces of this green, Lemon lime allegedly flavored Powerade, and then take this bottle of laxative powder. Again, over the counter stuff, and it said on the directions, it said take a capful of this and dissolve it in whatever amount of water and take that. Well, the directions the doctor sent me said take eight ounces of this powder a full measuring cup and dump it into 64 ounces of a pitcher of this goddamn cat piss green fucking Powerade. And now in the next hour, you need to drink eight ounces of this every 15 minutes. Don't drink it any quicker. It may cause you to vomit. No shit. Literally. So just as I'm about to start drinking this stuff and they, well, this is going to make me ill. All of a sudden I start percolating. Oh boy. And I'm thinking, you know what this, hold on. Put that in the refrigerator. I'll be back to that in a second. I'm going to run up to the office bathroom where it's quiet and I can stink the place up with impunity and I can have my experience here. By the time that I'm going through the vault, I'm like, oh, shit, I need to hurry up. And by the time I get into the office, I'm doing the butt clinch tiptoe thing. And boom, I got in the bathroom. It's in the nick of time. And there went that ham and cheese sandwich. And then I have to go back downstairs and start drinking this fucking concoction that is apparently like 40 times what they tell the average consumer that buys this shit over the counter to take. And I got to choke that 32 ounces of that down over the course of the hour. And I got to do that again with the other 32 ounces about four hours after that. And Jesus, Mary and Joseph, I can understand why that that cleans you out. 
It was not a, I didn't get a restful evening and night of sleep. So by the next morning, I was ready to get there and get it over with, right? So Stace has got to drive me because I'm apparently, I'm going to be administered some type of drugs. And or I they apparently figure that people just don't want to shit themselves while they're driving. But fortunately, by the next morning, it timed out conveniently enough that I had pretty much done what I needed to do before I got in the car. And we get a beautiful facility, did, by the way, over there. What what were you what are you gonna say? Did you ask anyone about that? About the timing? About what goes into the thought process of when you're supposed to start or stop something? When's the last time you're supposed to have something versus Again, you're taking all these things to flush you out, and you have to actually get in the car and go somewhere. Yeah, I well, I did. I took it to previous night, finished that, boom, and they said then don't have anything to drink after about four o'clock in the morning or whatever, and you can have water up until then, and then it it apparently it 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 was timed well. <laughs> as a matter of fact. After this, as I've mentioned to you before we went on the air, after this whole thing was over with, now my schedule is off. My morning Russo the day after was not loaded and ready and became my evening Russo. And as a result, today, I have not yet had a morning Russo. I'm apparently going to take an evening Russo. It could now change the very name of the morning Russo to an evening Russo. I don't know about these things. But getting back to where I was going, a beautiful facility over here, the U of L Physicians fucking network or whatever the fuck. They're doing better than it, than they are in basketball. I'll get to that here in a little while. But uh, they got a nice place there. Usher be right in private room just for the you know hour and a half or whatever I'm going to be there. Give me one of the gowns, get in the bed and everything, and then they come in and tell me, okay. You know, this is what we're going to be doing, and blah, blah, blah. We're going to give you the propofol. I said, wait, what the fuck? It was just on the news just like three or four days ago. This woman at a dental office at a strip mall somewhere around town, they gave her propofol to pull her tooth, and she died. And they're getting sued over it. I said, you know, Jesus, I know this is a hospital, but don't consider me like Michael Jackson. Do stop when I get enough. And so anyway, so they're, they take all of my vitals and they've got the IV in me and they hook me up to all this shit. And I tell you, I'm a pussy about all this stuff, right? Because I have, I know it's hard for everybody to believe, and sad for some, actually. It'll bring some to the verge of tears. I've never been seriously ill in my life. I've, I haven't been, for anything other than a wrestling-related injury, I have not been hospitalized since I was four years old. And then I, I had, like, almost pneumonia, and they put, they put me in an oxygen tent. I still remember that fucking son of a bitch, the way it hissed. and uh, It was actually cool for a little while. No pun intended. It was cool in there. And it was wet and drippy. But then after a while, I got antsy to get out of it. But nevertheless. Are you being serious? In, were you in an oxygen? Yes. Are you never? Yeah, well, they, you've they made they little jokes about the, it, but I always thought they were jokes. I didn't realize you were being serious. No, they did that back in the 60s. It wasn't an iron lung, but it was an oxygen tent. How long were you in there? Uh, like three or four. Actually... Did you feel like John Travolta in The Boy in the Bubble? It was, well, it, it, like I said, it was kind of cool at first, but the, the coloring books would get soggy and shit. Uh, but <laughs> I think, actually, I think my, my mom and dad milked the doctor. I was there for either three, four, five days, somewhere in that range. I don't know. I was four years old. Um, but I think they milked the doctor to keep me there a day or two extra because there was a big fucking snowstorm that hit concurrently with me being in there. And they didn't want to fucking, in those days, this was even before they finished the interstate out here, they didn't want to drive me home in the goddamn snowstorm. The town shut down. Anyway, nevertheless, I'm still, I'm back over here at the other hospital about my ass. So they do all this shit to me. Then they wheel me in and I say, Stace can sit there in the, in the room, right? And, and she's got her phone and everything. And they say, it won't take too long. Okay, so they wheel me back there, and as I come in the thing, and they haven't given me anything that I'm, I'm like, I'm still perfectly, you know, awake, coherent. 
possibly not cohesive, but I'm conscious. And, there, and the, the woman says, is, it's a woman doctor also. Is that told Stacey afterwards? She said, well, why wouldn't you want a woman doctor? They're just as cop. I said, I'm not worried about the competency. I'm worried about this woman 20 years younger than I am but from the looks of her staring up my goddamn Hershey Canal. You'd rather have some old man do it? Well, yes, because his at least would probably look worse than mine. I like having I, female doctors. I trust them. No, fuck that. Well, only only if it was in a more personal, personable instead of personal situation where we were a little more face to face on our first meeting. She, I'm afraid she saw me at the worst side of me, and especially when you know when I was younger, it might not be too bad. But then the doctors were all a bunch of old men. But now, but the, after things age and droop and drip and weather and things well you know sometimes you you want to at least dim lighting they had all the lights on do you think colonoscopy patients should be allowed the option of wearing a mask to cover their face to hide the shame no i think the mask ought to be applied to another area but well, besides how... that <laughs> well, here's another thing <laughs> what area are you gonna apply a mask well to? i well, goddamn, I guess I don't know. Maybe I could make it a little sling for the boys. Um, <laughs> here's something else they told me. I'm in the room. I'm like, well, how long is this going to take? Because I'm already ready to leave before they've started. And the nurse said, oh, said, let me just check. And she gets on the computer and says, oh, well, she's you're number five, but she's just finished number three. Now, it's 930 in the fucking morning at this point. I'm thinking, what the, has she been up somebody's ass since eight o'clock this morning? And what's she going to do with the rest of her day? How do they recruit people for that profession, for that particular line of work? What kind of day you have in front of you, Millie? Oh, I got like seven asses before lunch. I mean, I don't, what, somebody out there in the cult of Cornet has to know someone, be someone, have someone in the family, smarten us up, send emails to me and Brian as to how that they chose that particular field of medicine is something that they'd like to spend their days on anyway. So they, she said, it won't take, it'll be another, because it only takes a few minutes. Okay. Well, anyway, so they've wheeled me in there, and they're saying, okay, turn over this way. And then the anesthesiologist, the guy that told me about the propofol, he said, hey, how you doing? I said, well, hopefully okay. I'm, you know, I'm pretty perky. And he says, oh, and he's fiddling with the thing. And he says, you're going to start feeling something any minute now. And just about that time, I started to say, you know, come to think of it, I believe. And all of a sudden, I'm opening my eyes back in the room that I started from, staring at the bulletin board on the wall, and Stacy is staring, as I had asked her to do. I said, I, you're the last thing I'm looking at as I leave this room. You better be the first thing I see when I come back in. And there she is <laughs> Oh, leaning over me, hovering over me. I thought she's about to pick up the pillow and fucking, but then I found out the nurse was in the room too. So she had a witness and it was like a fucking hour later or whatever. And they had done the things they were going to do that shit. If Michael Jackson needed that to sleep, then he was goddamn inhuman of alien sent from outer space. But what I didn't know, the reason why Stace was still hovering over me is because she says that she's been around most of the time I've come out of anesthetic. When I've had my, uh, either a, the knee operation or the fucking various hernia and the fucking scope and the zabada. And she says, before I actually am coherent and speaking to people and have my eyes open, I'm trying to get up, <laughs> get out of the bed, take some shit off. It, in effect, I'm I'm needing to go home right then, and I can see that being in my nature. I'm I need to go, so she's holding me down like don't unplug anything, and then I wake up, and then it felt like somebody hit me in the fucking stomach with a baseball bat, and I'm oh shit I'm hurting. I said what the fuck they told me oh it wasn't gonna be painful. And I'm, Jesus Christ, I'm trying to sit up and I can't because my stomach hurts so bad. And the nurse says. You need to pass gas. I said, what? She says, you need to pass gas. And just then, I let the goddamn longest, loudest Andre the Giant fart. It wasn't. It wasn't that. It was more like. Yeah. Or even. That's an Andre the Giant? 
Well, maybe that. Yeah, whatever. Um, no, seriously, the the length and sustainability of it, and instant. Any after, smell? Or no. did they clean you out so there's no, no smell at all? No smell whatsoever. Because I'm like, I said, oh, I'm sorry. And she said, no. She said, do that. Keep doing that. And I'm like, what? And just a, and here comes another one. And she said, that's good. That's what you need to do. And she's actually now Stacy is also, yeah, come on, babe. And they're applauding and cheering as I let repeated fart after repeated fart. Because she, the nurse said, well, we've been up there and we took air with us. So you got to get that. And every time I'd let one, I would feel my, within about a minute. I didn't, my stomach didn't hurt anymore, but there, there, I was literally there while they were cheering. Come on, man, you can do it. Hey, and applauding me farting. When has that ever happened before in my life? Never, I say. And basically to go through all of that fucking procedure, the uh, summation of the advice was I need to eat more fiber. Farber? Not Farber. No, he's the guy on CNBC. Faber. Farber, that's right. You're talking no, about fiber. I need, I need fiber. He's he's apparently on the Home and Garden channel. I don't know, but I, yeah, that's the the advice now at this point is I need and I, and they gave me a list and all of the the list of all of the foods that have fiber are things that I never eat. And the list of foods to avoid if you need fiber are all the things I always eat. So I may have to have certain adjustments made here. But otherwise than that, um, because I, I must admit, I have gone overboard lately on the sweets when, since I have not really needed to control my weight or lose weight for the first time in my life. So I, I've got to, I got to get more fiber in there. So this wasn't your first colonoscopy, you said? No, that I had one. T after you're 50, supposedly, you're supposed to be getting these things. I think maybe it after 45, but... So you didn't have these issues with the farting or anything the last time? Well, I don't remember it like that, to be honest. And I remember shitting a lot. And actually, I re well, because I was 10 years younger. I also remember not feeling like shit the rest of the day. But I felt like shit the rest of the day also this time. Yeah, Michael Jackson was still kind of fresh in the news. That must have been real scary for you back then. I, they didn't tell me they gave me propofol back then. Do you go to sleep on your back or on your side? What? When they put you out. Oh, I thought you meant just normally when I'm usually on my back because I'm watching television. But there was nothing on in the operating room. Um... No, no, they said roll over on your side. They weren't going to try to, well, I guess they could get under me now that I'm a normal sized person and turn me over, I guess, if they had wanted to, but they had me do the work for them. All right. I need more fiber or farber, either one. That's what I need is some farber up my ass. Are you going to change your diet? Uh, well, yes, because I am, I'm, once again, whether it's a morning Russo or an evening Russo, I got some pissing to do. And so I need to be in, in the best shape possible. Are you going to start the day with fiber? Are you going to get like Cheerios or something or oatmeal? Cheerios? Well, now, <sighs> Cheerios, then I would be just eating a big bowl of sugar. If it, the, Cheerios? The, the, way, the Cheerios, are, aren't they the ones that are magically delicious with the leprechauns or what the fuck or ever? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no. How do you not know this? Come on now. Cheerios. Wait a minute, you... You're talking about Lucky Charms that are Lucky magically Charm, delicious. There you go. How do you confuse Lucky Charms with Cheerios? Because I don't eat cereal. Never eaten cereal in my life. You know what? Magic Spoon, it was all a lie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, maybe you want to try some Cheerios now that you're going to... Casey ate all the Magic Spoon. I never had it. But anyway, so I've got some, I've got some fiber supplements and some broccoli and broccoli. and some and some beans and uh, and all the other things on the list that they they said. But we've got to catch up on some recent miscellaneous stuff. All right, hold on, I'm getting my.
<clears throat> my miscellaneous file out here. And this has been the assy portion of the program today. This, is, this has been the, the yes. Well, it's a medical portion. It's a public service. And here's the thing. If you, you should do this because they can catch that asshole shit way early and you can still be free to pursue a life of religious freedom or whatever the fuck. But if you just, if you just neglect your anal orifice and it's associated environs until it's too late, well, then you're, you're, you're just fucked and not in the, in the way that your ass might particularly want to be fucked. So I recommend by the feather bottoms by the feather bottoms. <laughs> so, so get your ass checked. Uh, but anyway, while I, before I got the ass check, um, you know, I did cameos recently and, uh, Timothy from Traverse city, Michigan, who has a, uh, a wife with an, an unnaturally unwieldy spelling of her name that her name is Dawn. You would, if, if you hear it said out loud, it's Dawn, but she has like three N's and two E's at the end. And I don't know, I think her parents were ribbing her. And so, you know, he got a cameo. They drove down to see me and Bobby Eaton and Dennis Condry in Nashville, Tennessee, from Traverse City, Michigan. Drove to Nashville to see us on the first appearance of our 35th anniversary Fan Fest appearances. And uh, we gave him the travel award for that. But anyway, they got a cameo this past time. I did the cameos. And now Timothy, old Timothy, Timothy from Traverse City, Michigan, has written Jim, my wife, Dawn, -ni 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 -ni. and I just got done watching the cameo you made for her. It was excellent, except that I fucked up in saying she's receiving her master's in strategic leadership. It is actually her doctorate in strategic leadership. I would appreciate it if you could mention this on the podcast so I can get out of the doghouse and back sleeping in my own bed again. Brian, you're an educated man. What is the now what is the difference between a master's and a doctorate? Do you have certain rights and privileges with one that you don't with the other? I mean, in my eyes, is the difference is the amount of money you're going to spend and how many more years you're going to not be working. I mean, it's a sense of pride for a lot of people. They're happy to get it. But for someone like me who didn't go to college, I went to community college for two years and started working. I think it's all stupidity. So the answer to the question is, since you didn't go to fucking real college, you don't know what the difference between a master's and a doctorate is. A doctorate means more school. A doctorate means you're going to more school. And uh... Okay, so he shortchanged her. Instead of pumping her up, he shortchanged her. He said, Masters, it's actually her doctorate. She's gone even farther than the Masters. See, the move is to get one of the honorary doctorates. That's why, like, fucking Cosby insisted on people calling him Dr. Cosby. He wasn't a doctor. He didn't even get a doctorate degree that, like, by going to school. They just uh... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you talking about Bill Cosby? Yeah, Bill Cosby. What? Was not a real doctor? Well, I'm not even talking about the Cosby show. I'm talking about... No. In He's the one that gave me my first colonoscopy. You're so fucking stupid. Come on. <laughs> All right, I give up. Where were you going? I'm that? going nowhere. Raw well, rolls on. <laughs> let me ask you another question about this email. What the fuck is strategic leadership? It's modern mumbo jumbo is what it is. No, it's uh, no, now come on. Dawn wouldn't have spent all that time to, to be involved in mumbo jumbo. Well, unlike the leaders who, you know, just go off the cuff, this is actually having a plan and a strategy with your leadership. Well, something maybe why, you could use some help. That's why it's strategic. Yes. Well, if I just had, if I only had a plan. Well, I roasted him over the uh, coals, too, a bit about the fact that I didn't know what strategic leadership was or, or how to get there without a Rand McNally on the cameo. And uh, Timothy, I hope you're out of the doghouse and you might, be, you might be in divorce court at this point. But folks, if you would like a cameo such as was referenced in this email, because we try to do them for Valentine's Day, but we only can do 80 uh, in the course of a week with Hotchkiss and mine schedule, we shot 40 one day, 40 another day. Uh, so we limited it to 80. They sold out fairly quickly. So before we get busy here in the springtime, we're going to do another set of cameos on Saturday, March the 4th at noon Eastern time. 80 more going to go on sale. 
at cameo.com slash Jim Cornette, or just go to jimcornette.com and click on the Cameo button on the home page. My home page is so inviting, Brian. And it'll take you there, and as we mentioned, jump in as close to noon Eastern as possible on Saturday, March 4th, because they go quick, and if you missed out, you get another chance at redemption. All righty. Um, oh, you know, if now we find out there's been more of these Chinese spy balloons. They've just been ballooning the hell out of us. Did you hear about this, that there have been others before we heard about this one, and they just shot something else down over Alaska? Alaska, yeah. I just saw this. Uh, it happened yesterday, actually. And and we mentioned, that well, they shouldn't be shooting stuff down over populated area. That's why they chose Alaska. But uh, Christopher, or Chris Tasker, well, Christopher, that's his full name, but we're, we're familiar because we're friends, so I call him Chris. But Chris Tasker from over in Leeds, over in the U.K., uh, had a theory about this thing. We were, was it a weather balloon? Was it a spy balloon? He says, hey, Jim and Brian, I saw in the news a Chinese balloon was making its way across the USA and people speculating whether it was a spy balloon or a weather balloon, but I have a third theory. Could it be that the mystery balloon was in fact an enthusiastic member of the cult of Cornette who tried shooting helium up their ass and things got out of hand from there? Because we've just been talking about this, and suddenly, do you think? What do you think? You never know. Anything can happen in the WWE. Raw rolls on. Raw I was told. On. I was told by the anesthesiologist also that that wouldn't work. <laughs> by the way, I did. <laughs> you asked about. I that. did think to ask. You know, just did you think that's what the gas was? It was. Oh my God! They left the helium inside of me. Well, no. Th this was beforehand. I asked. To just you know, is idle chatter. And, and he idle said, chatter, by the way. Just idle chatter. Is, hey, you know, you know about the various gases and You're chemical an reactions and things. You went to school. and All right, another topic that we discussed here recently. It was Groundhog Day not long ago. And little punks of Tawny Phil, if that is indeed his real name, was in the news again. And we talked all about it. And we said, well, how did this start? What the fuck? How did this come about that people would be pulling a fucking rodent out of the ground to determine the fucking course of the change of the seasons well several readers wrote but i were readers several listeners wrote or several readers listened i don't fucking know you get what you get here folks with me after i've been given propofol uh jesse wrote a little info on the groundhog he lives in a heated private nest there are a team of people that care for him year-round. He is pretty much tame. So this fucking groundhog lives better than most people do. Punxsutawney, uh, Jesse continues, is in Jefferson County about 80 miles northeast of Pittsburgh and about 50 miles northwest of Altoona. They do sell merch there year-round, and this is also the hometown of Britt Baker before she went to Pittsburgh for school. So Brit is not from Britsburg. She's from Brunxatawney. Is that true? She's from a pair. Well, that's what Jesse says. Who am I to argue with Jesse? Do you think she should use that in her gimmick? I mean, she's been doing the dentist thing for a while. You can only do the Mike Lano she act for be, so long. And become a groundhog? And become a groundhog enthusiast. She could wear the big hat. She could have something that she... Pulls up like a little groundhog that she breaks in a ring. Wait a minute. She, she's a dentist. She can install her own groundhog teeth and she can look. Ooh. Like, and suddenly, Kevin on Reba. Dunn. On Reba. She tests it out on Reba. There you go. Reba gets the groundhog teeth. And then Kevin Dunn comes in as, as, as her <laughs> adopted father. Well, here's another uh, email with a little more experience, uh, a little more experience, a little more information. We asked another question. We said, "Is this happen anywhere but the United States, where dementia and and delusion runs rampant?" Apparently, it does, because Ben from a town in Ontario, Canada, that I can't pronounce, Listerine, Listowell, whatever the case. Dear Jim, like you, I also do not understand the logic appeal of Groundhog Day, but your rant on the latest experience got me curious, so I decided to do a bit of research. On a humorous note, it seems the origins of Groundhog Day have modern ties to AEW. 
The site of the first celebration in Punxsutawney sounds like it ought to be Marco Stunt's home, as it is known as Gobbler's Knob. Ben was trying to be humorous there. I got it. Right. I got it. Very, uh, very, that, uh, very relevant, a Marco Stunt joke. Yes. Well, that is actually, Gobbler's Knob is the place that, that they actually do this, but Punxsutawney is the town surrounding it. I guess, you know, I don't know why then the, the groundhog wouldn't be named Gobbler. But nevertheless, Ben continues, I come from Canada, which has its own version of Punxsutawney Phil named Weorton. Weorton. It's W I. <laughs> oh, shit. W I. Maybe the propofol did something. <laughs> w I A R T O N. Weorton? Weorton? Yeah. Willie. All right. Weorton Willie. He's farting. No, we aren't in Willie. That is a small town in southwestern Ontario, which is noted for little else other than its Groundhog Day event. Historically, Willie has been a white groundhog, although the current one is brown as they have had to replace him several times due to untimely deaths. One of these was so untimely that his that his corpse was actually paraded around <laughs> paraded around in a miniature coffin complete with silk lining. It was later revealed this corpse was not the actual Willie as he was far too decomposed for public viewing at the time, and he was replaced by a stuffed groundhog. Scandal abounded. Suffice it to say, what in the French fried titty fuck is wrong with some people? In Ontario, Canada. So they got that going for them. And remember, Brian, we talked the other day about, um, I got sent a, a, a gift from Professor Ouch of a, a book on carnival sideshow performers. We use the nice phraseology. And I mentioned a guy that the book was dedicated to that used to do circus promotion named C.M. Chris that also did wrestling promotion and worked briefly for WCW early 90s, uh, had done some stuff in the Florida office, and I got this email, Jesse from Boston. Hi, Jim and Brian. See, you're, you're a part of the show, Brian. I wish I wasn't, but go ahead. I recently heard you talk on the experience about CM Christ. CM Christ. CM <laughs> Christ. I bet mean, no. <laughs> That's going to be Punk's new gimmick, actually, when he comes back. To save AEW, CM Christ. <laughs> it's spelled the same way, by the way. C H R I S T. CM Christ. He was my old carnival sideshow boss back in the day and was nothing but a pleasure to work with. I'm happy to report, though, that he is, in fact, still with us, although retired from the road. See, I'd heard he had died. And that, that, as a matter of fact, I was like, remember when everybody thought Buddy Roberts had died in the, like, 1986, 87, for a period of time there? And then me and Bobby and Dennis walked into the locker room in Dallas, and there was Buddy Roberts visiting. And he was, he was covered in mud. I think he'd ridden a motorcycle up there. He had dirt all over his face. He hadn't taken a shower in a week. He'd just been out fucking mud bogging somewhere. And Dennis walked up and said, Buddy, I heard you were dead. I see they were right. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, so Jesse continues. I'll, I'll start back again. I'm happy to report he is, in fact, still with us, although retired from the road. His partner, Ward, did sadly pass away, though. Maybe that's where I got the story confused. Uh, he says it was pretty awesome to hear you talk about him. He sure had some pretty funny stories that pertain to wrestling and some of those in it. Anyway, thank you for talking about someone that it seems time is slowly forgetting. There are those of us, however, that won't ever forget his leadership. And uh, he also says, tell Harley High from Pippa, their Newfoundland, Newfoundland, and Monroe, their Clumber Spaniel. That's Jesse from Boston. So do you think... The idea of CM Punk returning to AEW as CM Christ is a personal shot at the Bucks because they're Christian? Well, only if you look at it that way. I think perhaps that instead it's just a, it would be a message to the people that he, he died 
for the EVP's sins, but now he has been resurrected in the name of ratings. But we'll talk about them later on. They got all <laughs> kinds of things going on. We'll see what happens. Um, and I got to complain about some one more thing before we get started on the, the wrestling this week. Remember I said a few weeks ago that the University of Louisville Cardinals men's basketball team sucked and had the worst record. It was ridiculous. And oh, how the mighty have fallen. They just lost to Pitt 91-57 to this past week. Do you know now what the University of Louisville men's basketball team's record is so far this season? I don't. 3-21. and 21. I th This may be the worst record for a U of L basketball team in a, the 112 years of the program. I don't know where they're going to finish up, but it, it, I don't see them as we near March madness, pulling out a lot of fucking more victories. I don't see them playing a lot more games. The, this is a, they were a dynasty 10 years ago, 2013. They were the national champions. The record was 35 and five. 30 years under Denny Crum, two NCAA championships, multiple Final Fours, a 700 winning percentage under the Hall of Fame coach Denny Crum. They started having, it was, I think it was 1946, they started a, a record 44 years in a row every season, a winning season, and then just fell short under 500 and broke that string and i don't know that they've had well it, over the last few years all that's out the window between the recruiting violations and the scandals and the blowjobs in the bathroom and the fucking hookers and the sanctions and the violations we've got to got half the pickup fucking teams on the playgrounds in west louisville could beat this team Thanks, Rick Patino, you fucking Yankee bastard. Uh, 31, 3 and 20, 31, 3 and 21, for fuck's sake. Folks, if you're not spending your money on tickets to go see the University of Louisville Cardinals play basketball anymore, and they, by the way, they had highlights on the news, there were empty seats at a L game in the Yum Center in the stands. Not even way up high, but right there down where God and everybody could see it. Empty seats at a University of Louisville basketball game. Jesus H. Christ. If you're not spending your money on those tickets, spend them at jimcornet.com because you get your money's worth. This, this merchandise has well over a 500 winning percentage. And you can also sign up for the email blast that Hotchkiss Featherbottom has invented to find out about new and or limited edition or limited number merchandise that goes on sale to the fine folks who sign up for the newsletter before it, or it, it goes, it's advertised to you before it's advertised to the general public. You get first crack at it. Uh, just go to jimcornet.com. And down at the bottom where it says sign up for our newsletter, you put your email address in there and Hotchkiss Featherbottom has devised a way NASA now is, I'll have you know, Brian, last NASA is on the phone and Google on the phone with Hotchkiss trying to get the patent for his email blast idea. He told me they called last week. It was Joe Google because Barney Google, the president of the company is on a cruise somewhere, but Joe Google was excited about talking to him about this opportunity. And by the way, folks, if you did order some of the limited number of behind-the-curtain graphic novel hardcovers that were offered briefly for sale on February 3rd and 4th, and they have not, you haven't gotten an email that they've been sent out yet, that's because my, my colon and its various issues and the state of it prevented me from signing the last 20 or 25 books until today, and Hotchkiss will be picking them up this week. Brian, have you got any colon stories? No, no colon stories. 
Not so yet. We got, we got to talk about the wrestling then, huh? That's the only colon story I have. Well, actually, before we get to people's colons, let's uh, uh, King Jerry Lawler once again. By the way, <laughs> the Teflon King—he's nipping up from what we hear on the drive-through. We were recording three days ago, or whatever it was, and you uh, saw that on Twitter come up that Lawler had suffered a stroke down in Florida, where he has a condo, and I think had just done an appearance. And we didn't know anything about it at the time. We said, oh, you know, hopefully this is not serious, whatever. Well, in that intervening time, while I was otherwise occupied, the first story out was, oh, God, it was really serious. And, but then as calmer heads prevailed and everybody got a firmer grip of the situation, obviously it's always serious when you have a stroke and are incapacitated and taken to the hospital. But he's already, as I said, the Teflon King. He's already conscious. He's been released from the hospital, I believe, as the this morning as we speak now to do. Uh, he's going to stay in his condo in Florida and do some type of outpatient rehab. He's not cleared to fly yet, but he was already on the phone and FaceTiming with uh, certain people, uh, what, a day after it happened. So. You know, with thankfully everything's okay, but and he's still got some rehab to do, and he can only, you know, uh, speak a few words at a time without being out of breath or whatever the case. But, um, so that crisis came and hopefully has gone pretty much over a couple of day period of time. But I spoke to somebody that had spoken to people in the inner circle that talked to him directly and. Uh, so far everything's looking positive. But and in fact, he'll so, be working next month against Bill Dundee in Biloxi, oh, quit. Mississippi. Quit. Wait a minute. Did you say Biloxi? I picked the wrong side of the state. That's you right. Picked I the did. wrong side of the state. In See, Tupelo, if, Mississippi. If you'd have said Boonville instead of Biloxi, oh, you'd have been. No one would have gotten that. No one would have. Said oh, that. I'm telling you. Only you. Uh, but uh, but anyway, but we. Uh, so again, you know, it, it, a heart attack. And a stroke and all this stuff. Lawler is, he's amazing. He nips up from this shit. But uh, I'm hoping that he might, you know, if he does, I guess at this point, you know, Lawler can have a match now. He could still wrestle and never fall down and nobody would even notice. So if, as long as somebody else is actually taking bumps, he can have a match and you would never, never notice it if he didn't fall down or or practically even be harmed in any way he can still get by with it he's unique in that but i hope he slows down on his schedule do you think he'll have another match um it what depends on what is what his doctors say after he gets over this because he's the wwe wouldn't clear him i mean the 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 physical examination that they give and have these guys undertake and the the tests they do and the blood work and all that stuff is comparable to like a NASA astronaut. And since he actually legally died on their air live, I, I can see why they wouldn't clear him. But he's been to plenty of doctors in between then and now and, and has not been ordered to cease and desist. So and and he gets by with it. And, I mean, you know, he died of a heart attack temporarily 10 years ago. And he's wrestled every year since then. So, you know, I don't, it, it depends on what the doctor or doctors tell him and how he feels after this. And, yeah, once again, it's not like he's catching somebody that's doing a dive on him or he's taking his big high backdrop anymore or whatever the case. I think I saw him three years ago. He, he still threw a one drop kick just to prove he could do it. But uh, I, a heck of a string if this is the end of it. If he even doesn't wrestle in 2020, well, he's already made 2023. So he'd have to be out for another year and 11 months to miss his string of once a year or at least every year for 53 years. Next year is would be 54. 
And River, we were talking about this on the drive through also. It was a, and it's not, we don't know if it's a record. It's an interesting factoid. Nobody has researched this particular topic to find out, but we can't think of a better example that somebody recently put up on the internet. Jerry Lawler wrestled Lou Thez. Lou Thez started wrestling in 1935. Lawler still wrestles today. This was last week before the stroke. So that's 88 years. Is that the longest, you know, stretch of, of wrestling history between two individuals? And I don't even know how you, what kind of record you would call that or how you name it or even explain it very easily. But, and I said, you know, I bet when Lawler started and he was working around Memphis before they saw something in him and sent him to Alabama, he probably at some point crossed paths with Herb Welch because Herb Welch was promoting Dyersburg and Jackson and Blytheville, Arkansas, and those West Tennessee area towns. And he would still work, even he was early in his early 60s at that point. So anyway, somebody sent me uh, the information that Lawler was in a seven-man battle royal in Jackson, Tennessee on January 12, 1972, and that battle royal was won by Herb Welch. So, and and by the way, at the time, Herb Welch was a much bigger name in Jackson, Tennessee wrestling than Jerry Lawler was before anybody saw the promoter put himself over. He was still putting himself over, but he could stretch everybody else in the fucking match. And that's when he was, you know, he was training guys like David Schultz and et cetera. So anyway, Herb at that point was about 64. Cause he was I actually didn't realize the- he was still wrestling when he was training guys. Oh yeah, well, he. I don't. I think you see on some of those, like uh, uh, the old Blytheville, Arkansas wrestling ads from '72 and '73, and that used to be on Twitter a lot. And, and you know, as a matter of fact, Seth Hansen, who passed away here a while back, uh, he used to put a lot of them up. But that was before Eddie Marlin took uh, Eddie Marlin or Buddy Wayne, one or the other, took it over. But it was Herb Welch's town, and he had a card there at the American Legion arena of two matches. And it would be an opening match. It would be two out of three falls. And then a tag team match would be two out of three falls. And that show would run between an hour and a half and two hours. And it was the local fans that he had built up. And I mean, it was in the hundreds. If not, you could draw a thousand people there because it was top guys off of Memphis television. When Memphis TV was hot, you'd just get a main event, a preliminary. And a lot of times Herb would still work on some of those shows or over in Jackson because of the name he had been in that territory for 30 years. And, uh, but, and the tickets in Blytheville would be 75 cents general admission, a dollar 25 ringside. And if they did a thousand dollars, then they only had six guys and a referee on the card. So they the building Herb probably got for fifty bucks, and the guys would make seventy five dollars, and they'd be close to Memphis after TV, and seventy five dollars fifty years ago would be what now about three hundred bucks, and Herb Weld should go home down the road with you know a couple hundred dollars, which today would be nearly a thousand. But nevertheless, the point is, as to pertains to this exercise. Roy Welch, we know, was wrestling in Texas already in 1930, and probably the Welch clan was from Oklahoma. He was probably broken in and trained a bit before that. He was, I think, six or seven years older than Herb. So Roy Welch definitely started wrestling at least five or six years before Luthez. Herb came later... But Roy was already in, so did Roy or did Herb start before 1935? Haven't been able to determine that yet. He would have been at that point in his late 20s, so chances are he probably had. But in that case, we've probably stretched this over 90 years. And then if you increase it to talk about guys that either Luthez or Herb Welch would have 
worked out with, then you're, you're getting guys that go back to the 1800s. You know, Roy Welch was partially trained by Cal Farley and Dutch, the original Dutch Mantel in Texas, who had been wrestling at that time since the 1900s. And Thez did gym workouts with the George Tragoses and those guys who, it, it's very possible that either one of them worked out with a guy who had been a professional wrestler by that description in the 1800s. I always like those games where you can kind of trace things back. I guess it's the seven degrees of Kevin Bacon or whatever it was years ago when it took off. Actually, you're supposed to cook bacon at at least 350 degrees, but I see what you're going for there. Like, if you wanted to figure out who is the... Is there anyone still wrestling? No, I guess not. I answered my own question. I was going to say, is there anyone still wrestling today that would have worked with Vern Gagne? And I can't... Unless it's someone from Japan, I can't think well, of anyone. Well, hold on. Vern... Vern... It worked until 1981. And then did right. he... he what, who was his comeback against? Bockwinkle. It, no, who was it? He did another comeback in a tag team oh. thing. Greg in in eighty four ish. Bruiser Brody and Jerry Blackwell was it, or it was Bruiser Brody and someone? I think no. it was Bruiser Brody, Adnan El Casey. So Adnan, Adnan El Casey, there we Adnan go. Casey still alive, and Adnan Casey uh, did he? He was high level amateur for the. All right, was he from Iran or Iraq? I forget. I think it was Iraq, and I think actually you hit me with something in a guest your program a while ago that we traced him back. I think at least to the late fifties, right? Yes. He was already wrestling in the late 50s. He's still alive. He he would have worked with Vern. Um I bet there there's more. Well, Greg is still alive. He worked with Vern as as tag team partners. But Vern then would go back to it, you you said uh, when we were talking about this earlier, he'd go back to Joe Stecker. Yeah. But, well, now, did Vern work with, was that Vern's first? I don't know if he worked with him. No, he, but he didn't, he didn't work with him. Now, we're talking about who worked with somebody in the ring. Vern worked for him. Yeah. But who, um, Abe Cashy, King Kong Cashy was Vern's first opponent in his first pro match because he was a trusted veteran that they wanted to shine Vern up and put him over big. And he had been in the bed, that was 1949. He'd been in the business for at least 20 years. So. All right, let's look at Flair. Because you know Flair's career pretty good. Who, at any point in Flair's career, and I guess it probably would have been within the first 15 years, who did he wrestle that would have gone back the furthest in wrestling? I mean, he wrestled Buddy Rogers in 79, but I don't know if Buddy Rogers would have went back further than maybe someone Flair wrestled in 73. Uh, oh shit. Um, George Becker. It, wh when did George Becker retire in the Carolinas? It was before Flair came in, was it not? It was either right yeah. before or, you know, right around the same time. So I think it was before. He was working in the late thirties, but he doesn't apply because he quit beforehand. Did Flair ever work with Bull Curry in some kind of crazy Toronto situation? I wouldn't think so, only because Probably not. Bull Curry would have only been in Toronto, I, I believe, I could be wrong. The last chance would have been when the Sheik was working with Toronto, Flair would have come in with Mid-Atlantic. Did Sweet Daddy Seeky work preliminaries in the Carolinas in the 70s? I'm not sure. See, you're going to the Carolinas. I was actually thinking when Flair broke in in Minneapolis, who did he work with? Well, but he wasn't there long and only worked with underneath guys. And the underneath guys, they weren't still using the underneath guys when they were 60. And still, even then at that point in time, the early 70s AWA, they didn't keep a big roster. And there was, I mean, Crusher started in 49. So did Byrne. Um... Stevens was early 50s, so was Bachwinkle. You know, so I think Flair may have crossed paths with Johnny Heidman. 
in the Carolinas. He he was a he was a rookie in the World War II years, probably. So he he would probably have run into older wrestlers as he went to the Carolinas during that transition. Because one thing about the guys on top in the Carolinas, once they got on top, they stayed there forever. The baby faces mostly. And they were over and you couldn't blast him out with dynamite, but that's why it ended up, you know, George Becker was wrestling when he was fucking 60. But they, they, they needed a renovation, Brian, of talent. They needed new looking, modern looking space age talent. That's what you need in everything. You need a new look. You need a, a paint up, a clean up, a fix up. You, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Well, maybe not in general, but certainly when I, go maybe to the bathroom and I look at the shower. I'm like, you know, I wish we did this better. Well, every time I go to the bathroom, I realize I need to repaint the walls. But folks, I'll tell you, if you're like Brian and you're uncomfortable every time you go to take a dump, because you just I didn't sit there say and, that. Well, you're sitting there taking a dump and you're looking around saying, I live in a dump. Let's face it. I didn't say that what either. Is, what's one of the first rooms of the house that gets crotch rot? The bathroom. It's got all the places where things can grow and multiply and fester and stew and bubble and squeak until finally it looks like a creep show episode gone wild where your whole shower has hair and green mildew and fungus growing from it and it's an entire science project and the grout, oh the grout, the grout is grotten. That's a combination of rotten and grout, grotten. The grout is grotten because it's got all that stuff growing in it also. And every time you put your kids in the bathtub or the shower to clean them off, something attaches itself to their skin and they begin acting strangely. It changes their whole personality. Folks, don't let these things happen to you. Certainly not. No, remodel your bathroom with our friends at West Shore Home, who are the fastest growing shower and bath remodeling company in the United States of Buy Gum America, they fully replace, and you've seen the TV commercials. If you haven't, you're living under a rock. They fully replace your old shower or bathtub with the modern showers or baths in just one day. Just what they start early in the morning. Now, if your cock is out there crowing, that means they're already at work. They're going to roust you up out of bed about 3.30 and they're going to bring in some drills and some hammers, and they're going to go to whacking. No, no, no. Let's not. Let's let's move past all of that, Jim. Let's renovate well, no, this I'm, ad. I'm, I'm, let's renovate if... this spot right here, and let's talk about the fine things that the fine people at West Shore Home will do to your fine home. Well, yeah, they'll they'll do something to your fine home, all right. No, they they'll come when you want them to. If if you're not a farmer and you don't get up early with the roosters and the chickens and the pigs and the donkeys and the cats and the dogs and all the other things, they'll come at nine o'clock. If you're just a boring old white meat baby face, they'll come at nine o'clock in the morning, but they'll start right then and they will apply themselves fully. And by dinner time that night, by dinner time, so that you can invite them all around your dinner table to share a fine repast and celebration of their excellent work, if you so desire, that is they will required. have... It's not required, but boy, what a rude prick you are if you don't just eat right in front of them when they're starving and sweating. You've done nothing all day. You, you don't have to be lift rude. a finger. You wouldn't be rude at all. You would just be doing things the way they're supposed to be done, and it is not on you to feed the wonderful people from West Shore Home. Well, it's, it's the legal burden is not on you, I suppose, but I would think a moral obligation. These people have slaved for you all day to get this ready in just one day before dinner. So you could have all the kids and the neighbors come in and say, hey, look at my brand new shitter. But but no, they're sweating. They're, they're heaving all over themselves to get this done while you're sitting back not lifting a finger all day. It takes more effort to, to take the dog out for a walk, and then you're not going to feed them. Well, that's up to you, but they don't expect it, but it sure would be nice. Nevertheless, they're going to take out the old shower or bath. They're going to install the new one. They do all the cleanup. Boom, it's done. And... The way they're able to do this, folks, is because with their design consultants coming over to your house early, most of the time while you're not around. That way they can get a good look around at that's everything. That's not what they do, and you know that's not what they do. Well, and they everyone don't should know that they have no expectation of people looking into your house when you're sleeping. 
That's why, no, not while you're sleeping. You don't need to be there at all. Just walk out of your home and leave the door standing open, and they'll come over while you're gone. They'll look around at everything so they don't bother you. You're not no. even there at the time. The people at West Shore Home are so reputable that they would never even agree to that. They want you there. They want to make sure you are supervising them until you decide to go watch TV or something. All right, well, I'll agree with you there. They do want you there so they can get a good eyeball of Stop you. it. No. Nope. And find out whether or not Stop. you're the kind of people they want to be doing doing business with. They want to do business with the kind of people that listen to the Jim Cornette experience. Well, why would you want those people in your fucking life? There's got to be something wrong with them. But the design consultants who come over at some point will show you all this stuff and, and give you all the options, and then you build it yourself. The laser-etched designs, the built-in seats, the shelves, the doors, the windows, the magnetic shower heads. Holy my, I wonder if they do bidets. I, I don't see bidets. You on asked the list. about that the other day. Are you into yeah. bidets? Well, I'm apparently not. I can't find anybody to do one. But anyway, folks, <laughs> you need to call West Shore Home and or check out promo.westshorehome.com backslash gym. And if that's too long for you, just remember promo.westshorehome.com backslash gym. See, that's shorter. Happiness is just a phone call away or just westshorehome.com. You're going to get the fastest, easiest, and most convenient home remodeling experience that you will ever have in your life. And I can't wait to get them out there out here this year for all the things because they do doors. Are and you rubbing too. your hands together? I'm rubbing my hands together in anticipation. Hear that? Because they do. You can find out if you check the website westshorehome.com. If you can request their free window and door remodeling preview in, the, in your location. And speaking of locations. <laughs> Here we go. <sighs> nah. If you live in or around Louisville, Lexington, Cincinnati, Indianapolis, Pittsburgh, Harrisburg, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Richmond, Salisbury, Virginia Beach, Winston-Salem, Charlotte, Greenville, Asheville, Knoxville, Chattanooga, Charleston, Wilmington, Myrtle Beach, Greenville, New Bern, Columbia, Atlanta, Jacksonville, Orlando, Ocala, Tampa, Birmingham, Huntsville, Montgomery, Oklahoma City, Houston, Dallas, Austin, San Antonio, Phoenix, Denver, Colorado Springs, and Salt Lake motherfucking city. Check them out, baby. West Shore Home. Well, speaking of something that apparently needs renovated, this long-delayed, fictitious, myth mythological AEW video game, we've been talking about it. Fight Forever. The latest Fight Forever. Take Forever, apparently. <laughs> is the, and we've talked about that lately, and, and the last thing we heard was that they were fighting over the rating. The rating was... They were going to give it an adult rating because there was so much blood. And I started thinking before, I know you've got some updated information there, but here's the thing. It's a fucking video game. Not only is it not real blood, it's not real people. How can it be? How can it, it, it you, they put a rating on it where you have to be the same age to play this video game as you do to enlist in the United States army for, I mean, it's a video game. I'm thinking of Super Mario. He's hopping around. He's got the pizza or whatever. Somebody dings him with a hammer. He's bleeding from the fucking head. Is that going to be offensive? Or with Frogger. Well, Frogger's hopping across the road and the car runs over. It's flat and there's a pool of blood. Is someone going to be traumatized by that? If Frogger took out an AK-47 and started shooting the people in the cars and then took one of the cars turned on his favorite radio station, and just started driving fast and shooting as he's going, that may require a rating. Yeah, but if Super Mario's one of the people and he pulls him out of the clown car, it's a video game. If Super Mario has a knife and he cuts Frogger's throat... Yeah, it's that, a frog! That may require a rating, just so a parent is aware that there is... Violence against frogs? Plumber on frog violence. Was Mario a plumber? I thought he was a pizza maker. He was a plumber. Him and his oh. brother, the Mario brothers, they were plumbers. They were fucking around with the pipes, and they had a lot of problems. And Oh, well, you know what? I thought Super Mario was a pizza guy because of Super Mario in West Virginia. Jimmy Vagant's friend, the little fat guy that owned the pizza restaurant, they broke him in as Super Mario because he gave him all free food at his restaurant if they let him wrestle. 
and he was so fucking short and rotund that when his finish was a big splash, but he'd just kind of fall forward and his belly stuck so far out, he'd roll all the way across the guy to where he was on his face with his feet straight up in the air. And he's, but he had a great restaurant up there, Bluefield, West Virginia. What do you think of Lou Albano as Super Mario? He looked, actually, this guy looked more like Mario than Albano did because he literally was fucking five feet tall and completely round with short little arms. But he had a great restaurant up there from what I hear. Anyway, it's still, it's a fucking video game. It's not, I guess they've improved them lately. I guess the human beings look a little bit better, you know, more like human beings than Mario did, don't they, now these days? I guess, but again, the AEW video game, there's been, I think we could safely say various holdups, and one of them has been reported to be the ratings issue, and it is now taken care of. It is now resolved. Well, now, what what rating did they get? They get the rating they what? Did they get seven stars because it was in the Tokyo Dome from Uncle Dave? Or what is the rating they got? And what were they wanting? Do you think they let you use the Tokyo Dome in the game? Well, you'd have to get the rights from the Tokyo Dome owners to do that. Well, you could just say we're here in a dome in Tokyo. This was rated T for Teen ESRB. Oh, ESRB is the Entertainment Software Rating Board. They rated it T for Teen with... Blood, language, mild suggestive themes, <laughs> use of alcohol and tobacco. What? Violence. What, okay, I guess use of alcohol would be, do they have their equivalent of Steve Austin celebrating with a beer afterwards? Uh, they can't do it with Plumber Moxley now. Who's drinking on the show or on the game, on the show? Who would be drinking on this game? Paige isn't a drunk anymore. He's just. An empty-headed dipshit. But he doesn't drink anymore, so who's... You know, they cut that angle out about the time that one of their wrestlers actually had to go to rehab, so maybe that was a good thing, but who would be drinking now? Well, it says use of alcohol, not drinking of alcohol. It could be just the throwing of alcohol. The throwing of... Uh, uh, a cup of beer. The throwing you throw of a cup alcohol of beer. can't... It, 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 it somehow has an impact on the ratings? Well, we have a rating summary. We have a summary of the rating. Well, the, summarize it, the summary for me. Once again, this is AEW Fight Forever, as rated by the ESRB, the Entertainment Software Rating Board. Rating summary. This is a wrestling game in which players compete in matches with wrestlers from the AEW roster. Players use punches, kicks, and grappling maneuvers to drain their opponent's health. In some matches... Wait, wait, ho. Oh. To drain their opponent's health? Well, to be fair, if you're playing a game and there's a health bar for each character, you want to drain the health bar to have your opponent in a state What are you, you Dr. Fucking Kevorkian? You want to drain the health bar? <laughs> that is the weirdest goddamn terminology. That I've ever, So you're not trying to defeat your opponent in a game of skill, you're literally trying to sap his life source and essence away from him and kill him. No, it's not like that, but you can't just pin... Let's say you're John Moxley and I'm Brian Danielson. You can't just uh, pin me in... Wait a minute, hold on. How did we get those fucking... Okay, 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 we okay. Put that around a little bit? I'll fix it. Let's say you're John Moxley and I'm CM Punk. <sighs> There's no way you would just pin me in the first, like, five seconds. You would have to beat me, you'd have to bloody me, you'd have to take me out of the ring and do all your shit. My health bar would be at full health. You have to get it lower and lower and lower. Diminish have, it. Diminish it to have me in a state where you could defeat me one way or the other. Well, then shouldn't it be your energy bar instead of your health bar? Well, you could call because it Because I'm, I'm fucking beating you up till you can't get up and fight anymore. I'm not giving you goddamn terminal cancer. Well, let me continue. We haven't even gotten too far into this. All right, well, but we've gotten far enough, but go ahead. In some match types... Like barbed wire, stadium stampede, and unsanctioned, players can use barbed wire, baseball bats, metal chairs, and Molotov cocktails. What? what? Against the phone. Wait, wait, hold, hold. <laughs> hold on, hold on. <laughs> Molotov cocktail. What match is that? <laughs> how did how do you introduce that do you pull it out of your tights do you go under the ring and come out with a molotov cocktail and light it with a flamethrower why haven't they done this on television 
if they're going to be selling it in the video game. They've got Molotov cocktails in their fucking video game, is what you're telling me. What happens is if you're really good, you unlock something where a friend of yours from Brighton Beach shows up and drives by and just hands you the Molotov cocktail, and then you do your business. I can't explain that. But once again, barbed wire, baseball bats, metal chairs, Molotov cocktails against opponents, eventually resulting in submission and or knockouts. Blood splatter effects can occur during matches. Blood splatter effects? Now what is this, the goddamn Dr. Sam Shepard case being revisited? They have to have blood splatter. Well, blood splatter effects can occur during matches, staining the mats. Video footage of real matches also depicts blood on wrestlers' faces and bodies. The game contains some mildly suggestive material... Female wrestlers in reveal. Well, how can that be? Nobody in that company ever gets laid. How can it be suggestive? The game can say, contains some mildly suggestive material. Female wrestlers in revealing outfits, like deep cleavage, <laughs> bunny outfits. Wait a minute. Porsche. Yes. That, hold on. Hold on. Stop. Pump the brakes again. That's their next female superstar. Here she comes to challenge Jane Cargill. Deep cleavage. That's the sign Russo's back. As soon as that shows up on TV, deep cleavage. Well, they've got it right there on their game. Well, here it is. Revealing outfits, deep cleavage, bunny outfits, partially exposed buttocks. <laughs> which has to be every woman on the roster at this point. Wrestlers performing taunting gestures like crotch chop and slapping buttocks. Real footage sometimes depicts wrestlers drinking alcohol and smoking. Oh, that's interesting. The word shit is heard in the game. <laughs> the word the word shit is heard about the game, too, apparently. So there's real footage of wrestlers drinking and smoking. What the fuck is that? What are they smoking? <sighs> so, uh, so does this interest you? The idea you could play a wrestling game and, you know, at the end throw a Molotov cocktail and then slap someone's buttocks. <laughs> Whatever the fuck is going on here? Oh, only if I get to drink afterwards. Uh, <laughs> While smoking, yes. Why, I mean, and yelling again, shit. The, the game doesn't interest me if it looks anything like 90% of the roster, which is what I'm afraid it's going to look like. And, and since we know who was in charge of the game... We know who's going to be heavily featured in the game. It's going to be, uh, well, and actually it should be, because all of the people that the Buckaroos and Old Twink uh, appeal to and their style of wrestling are all the people that are sitting around playing video games with their joysticks in their hands. Um, you know what, but in, so, this, in this case, I'm going to separate the Bucks from Omega, because I said a while back Omega's going to be the first one of the EVPs, the next EVP, I guess I should say, to be out the door. That's still my thought if this game bombs i think he's gonna have a nervous fucking breakdown <laughs> i'm not even like joking or anything i think if no, this he, game he's a bombs fella. yeah he's gonna have a nervous fucking breakdown because they've taken this joker that's you know best noted for fucking his physical exploits with sex dolls and put him in charge of something they've spent tens of millions of dollars on what could possibly go wrong? That's like, you know, giving Boeing over to a fucking frequent flyer. Oh, he's flown with us a million miles. Let's let him run the company and build the planes. Just because you've been a video game nerd all your life doesn't mean necessarily that you're going to be able to fucking convert that into knowledge of how to build one the right way or the most financially uh, feasible or conservative way. Or on a timely basis. Go ahead. Do you think a Molotov cocktail is a finish? I don't. Maybe. Maybe that's the. That's what they're drinking. Maybe <laughs> they're they've drinking. got. It, <laughs> really? Maybe they've got it fucked up on the review, and they're not throwing the Molotov cocktails. They've got the Miro, the Bulgarian brute, is drinking a Molotov. That's where the drinking comes in. Maybe that's where the smoking comes in too. Yeah, because he's his fucking smoking hot wife that he's got. <laughs> That wasn't what I meant, but okay. Hey, Jim, uh, we can return to this in a second, but I wanted to play you this. I'm talking about Captain Lou Albano as Super Mario. Here's a PSA from Captain Lou Albano 
Just say no to drugs. As Super Mario. I'm Captain Lou Albano talking about drugs. Kids, don't be afraid to say no. Anyone that asks you to use drugs is not your friend. Drugs can and will kill. Remember, don't be afraid to turn to your priest, your rabbi, your minister, your moms, your dads, your teachers, because drugs can kill. And if you do drugs, you go to hell before you die. There you go. <laughs> if you do drugs, you go to hell. <laughs> before you die. Before you die. Now, that's extra punishment. I always heard the fucking order of events was you die and you go to hell, but they're going to send you to hell before they even kill you. And made, the irony of Captain Lou. Was he, didn't, it, he didn't say anything about vodka. He didn't say, don't drink vodka. Ay, ay, ay. Or Vince will fire you. So this video game, I guess we're one step closer to it actually emerging, finally. <laughs> one step closer to... Fight forever coming out of its hole and seeing its shadow. And then we're going to have six more months of preparation and development. Well, speaking of preparation and development, can we go into the AEW television program from this past week? We're going to talk about AEW Wednesday and SmackDown on Friday. But I have... On AEW television, I have now officially seen more Blades on their television program than I ever saw when I was actually in the locker room. It, I was at the start of the It sounds like you're being match. hyperbolic, but actually... No! Um, it, when the show started and the first match was MJF and our friend Take a Shit, I was going to say, boy, the new production guy, I'm really liking it because he finally shot... MJF's entrance the right way when when he gets in the ring and he walks around with his hands out and he drops down on his knees and he is they always used the hard camera and invariably where he would be kneeling the the middle rope would be in front of his face whatever this guy instead of shooting it with a floor looking up with kind of a fish eye lens he takes up the whole ring he looks glorious but now for the compliments that I give the new production guy on the, the increased use of the floor cams, the better lighting, the nicer jib shots make the crowd look bigger, etc. <laughs> I realized after this show, he's got no experience whatsoever not shooting blade jobs because he spent his entire wrestling career in, working for the WWE. He's a major league television producer, but when somebody's over there going, don't shoot him. He's getting juice. He's the guy's going, what? What are, what are you talking about? <sighs> well, again, it hasn't been just this producer in AEW because it's been happening for a long time. Jericho no, no, but, on several but, occasions, Moxley. No, no. But I, honestly and truthfully, in a lot of cases, uh, from what I've seen before, it's the talent's fault specifically because, I mean, what are they supposed to do? Shoot goddamn... Grandma Fanny in the fucking fourth row of general admission instead of anybody in the ring because they're being so obvious with it, but this guy is getting close-ups. The producer... Well, there's a lot to go, to go over here. We'll talk about what happened in the match and then potential ways that they could prevent it from ever fucking happening again. But I loved this match, except... And I can't even say it's Take's fault. Because, obviously, this is the first time. Obviously, it's the first time he's ever done this before. And I bet he was scared shitless. Not of the physical act, but of being caught or being seen or fucking it up or not doing it right. But anyway, before we get to that, which unfortunately took a lot of people's attention away from the match, the match was fucking great. And I will say this, MJF, now that Punk is not active, is putting together the best matches start to finish for himself of anybody maybe in the business. And a lot of this stuff, it, it's, not, it's not difficult, deep shit. It's psychology. It's wrestling. And I recognize a lot of these spots that he does, but the way he puts everything together with the new stuff and the old stuff and the little stuff and the big stuff, it's like, there are only a certain amount of notes in music, but the difference in the way they're put together is the difference in Happy Birthday to You and Box Concerto or whatever. Well, he's 
MJF is stealing, perpetrating, researching different little things that nobody does anymore and different spots that a heel gets heat with and he's putting them together in still enough of a modern style match that it's it's impeccable. And again, the idea for this match was that Take is the fair-haired young white meat baby face. They want him to look good. The people are liking him, but obviously MJF is the champion and he needs to get some heat. And it was from from MJF going for the handshake and giving him the boot to the gut when he opened, you know, the the match. Just that little heel bullshit. But then letting Take come back and fucking get on top of him with the clothesline and the nine horrible punches in the corner. That's another thing Take needs to work on is his punches. Because he's been with the indie-rific crowd and he can do all the athletic moves, but it's the simple things. Um, but again, MJ, he'll hide behind the referee so he can take over and then immediately starts working the arm and the arm is a story through the whole match. And he kept, he would give take brief hope spots, but he'd go back to the arm when what a nice hammer lock DDT he hit without giving the kid brain damage. That's something they could note for later on in the program. You know, again, he kept this thing moving. It was put together well. And by the time he built up another little false comeback for take, where he hit the frog splash off the top, they're in El Paso, Texas. So, of course, it not only gets a two count, a big pop, but the people start chanting, Eddie, Eddie. And I, I wish I could be more full-throated in my endorsements of young take and really root for him more. But, of course, I've seen the video with the small schoolgirl and all the other bullshit. So he's one of them, but he's a talented one of them. He's one of the only ones I've seen. He's young enough. He could be reformed. Possibly he can go to reform school. Maybe we can work on that. Get him some psychological treatment, get him away from the wrong side of things. But he hit a styles clash thingy and then turned it into a wheelbarrow German suplex. And MJF would bail to the floor and the people would boo because that's what they're supposed to do, and they did, because he was a heel, and he's a chicken shit, and he's running away from an ass kicking. And did you see when he, when old Take followed him out on the floor and posted MJF, the fans started chanting, you deserved it. You know, he keeps them engaged with, they are interested in the match, not because of the moves that are being done, but because of the moves that are being done to him, MJF, or by him, to the other guy. There's a difference in the way they follow the shit. And the one thing in it, I was conflicted on this because they fought on the top rope, jockeying for position, you know, the, the deal where they're, maybe MJF's going to back suplex him, but then Tate turns around and clotheslines MJF, and he cut a complete backflip and landed on his feet in the middle of the ring and grabbed, like, sold his mouth, but, like, not tough enough, and fucking turns around and blisters take a shit. It was a long setup, but it was a wild-ass move. Does it really make sense? I'm not sure, but goddamn, it was impressive. It was one of those things, Brian. What'd you think? I don't have too big a problem with it. It was a great match. I'm not going to nitpick. Yeah, but, I mean, well, that specific thing, but it was, again... It was fabulously visual. And then they traded the forearms. People are chanting, this is awesome. And then again, telling the story. MJF has been going after the arm all that time. Well, then again, when, uh, oh, and I forgot, one more MJF hid behind the referee and then kicked the rope on his crotch, blah, blah, blah. But then he missed the knee drop. And MJF starts selling his knee. And again, that's the, the when MJF hit a power bomb. then a couple minutes later on the power bomb thing he does where he power bombs the guy on his knee, he hurt the same knee and sold that. And they little things like getting a leg on the ropes for by MJF when take almost had him. That got the people. And then finally, 
take missed the senton off the top rope and mjf got the arm bar take was trying to get the ropes but mjf rolled through and cranked up on it and got the tap out and it was a great match and that was the right result he's going into the main event of the pay-per-view he needs the big win but they again gave the people another imagine if I don't know anybody that deserved it had actually got as much TV time. And I'm not saying he doesn't, but in the last three years, when a guy starts getting over and popular, usually that's when they disappear. At least now, Tony's giving them old take. So there was the match. And if it had ended right there, I'd say they hit pretty much of a home run. Right? Give me your thoughts to this point. I thought it was an excellent match. I loved it. I like Takeshita. I like him a lot. I think he's really good. I'm going to ignore everything he's done before he got to the States. Not that everything was him wrestling children or whatever, but at least he's not Kota Ibushi. That's what I always say. Oh, well, there you go. But I'm not. I, everything they've done with him so far has been good. And, you know, we could talk about it a little bit later because now something we've been talking about for a long time is all of a sudden being noticed by other people. The fact that AEW doesn't have any top stars or any top baby faces, really. They're building him up and the fans are into him. And I feel like they spent so much time over the last year with Yuta and Garcia, not that they're not talented, but pushing them way past yeah. where they should have been pushed. And if you think about all of that TV time, it wasn't used to either reinforce why fans should care about someone you already have there, whether it be a Wardlow who they completely bungled or various people or find a way to make someone new because you've got a real problem at the top of the card. So again, ignoring whatever it is that he's done that offended you and probably would offend a lot of us. <laughs> he's been good so far. They're not over pushing him. The fans and, are taking and, and, to hey, him. Just, real quick. You mentioned Garcia and Yuta. There's a difference between deciding you're going to push somebody before the people ever see him. And then the people say, oh, okay, we're supposed to cheer him. And the people just deciding we want to cheer this guy. And then you start pushing him. Right. That's what the difference is. The acclaimed may not be as good in the ring as a Garcia or a Yuta technically, but the fans chose them. And that's why their matches started working and everything started working. Maybe this is the wrong week to use that example. I was about to say, well, we'll get to them. But I thought it was a great match. One of the best matches in Dynamite history, dare I say. All right, here is the the problem. <sighs> is twofold. None of it was MJF's fault because I mean, all of this stuff was right to do. The problem was, again, they've got a bunch of people that are inexperienced and green at or whatever they're trying to do and we can pretty much figure from this that take has never gotten color before and as i said earlier was probably concerned about uh, fucking it up not hurting himself but the, the other way losing the blade or not uh, something like that because he didn't carry it with him because after the match the referee, Paul Turner, gives MJF the diamond ring, dynamite diamond ring, and immediately he shoves the referee down, uses the ring, punches Take in the head, and boom, and Take is going to bleed, and MJF's going to get on him, beating him up, and then Danielson's going to come out and save him. Well, apparently, as MJF is glorifying, and you would think drawing all the attention away you know he's turned to the hard camera he's getting his hand up blah 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 paul turner they apparently decided he'd be the one to hand take his blade but that again they just happen to get a close-up as paul turner reaches in his pocket and hands the blade to fucking take and <laughs> Not only that, but uh, okay, and, and again, it's common if a guy has never done this before, or maybe only once in his life or whatever, he he doesn't want to carry it on his wrist because he's afraid he'll lose it. It'll come off. He doesn't want to carry it on his finger. You don't want a guy that's never done it before carrying it on his finger. He's going to have a 20-minute match. He could, could commit mayhem. So maybe he's decided the referee's going to hand it to him. Okay, that wouldn't have been a problem if the guy was any smarter about how to take it, and if they weren't shooting a close-up of it at the time when the referee hands it to him, but then 
after he gets it handed to him, take rolls away and repositions the blade. He's rolling across the ring and he's repositioning the blade in his hand where now the hard cameras, because they've got off the close-up, the hard camera is shoot, And you can still see the fucking tape around the blade in the guy's hand from the hard camera. And then... Turner's handing the MJF the ring and MJF nails take and take goes down and get, he gets his color and they didn't manage not to shoot that. But then when they got on or when MJF got on take, it starts punching him. He still had the blade in his hand and it was, you could tell because he's holding it in his thumb and his finger. And not only could you see the tape, but you could see the blood on his thumb and his finger. He didn't put it away. What he did when Danielson comes, runs in and saves, and the doctors are checking on old take, Paul Turner is there, but he's the referee. He's kneeling down, but he's just, you know, surveying the scene, and the doctor's putting the compress on the guy's head. And you can see take, look up, and, and say something like, hey, rep, rep. And the referee's what? He reaches his hand out and hands the blade back to Paul Turner, which was a completely unnecessary handoff. And they're on a close up again. What the fuck? He could have, as soon as he got his shit, well, before MGF even got on him, he should have put it away. Because he didn't have to wrestle anymore. All he had to do was lay there and sell. It wasn't like he was going through a 20 minute match. He, he put it in his tights. Put it in his knee pad. He's been selling his arm through the entire match. He was wearing an elbow pad. Put it in your elbow pad. Hold it in your mouth. If it was done right, and I assume somebody made it for him, it's no thicker than a dime. And I know a lot of people are saying, well, don't put it in your trunks. You'll cut your dick off. Number one, it's no thicker than a dime. You're not going to give yourself an emergency appendectomy with this fucking thing if it was done right. And secondly, most people it, wear under trunks and you try to slip it in between your outer trunks and your under trunks. But they're, it keeps it in place there. That's why they're called tights. They're not baggy. It's not going to be floating around your balls to lay there and sell. Or, for God's sake, uh, again... Once that he got nailed with the ring and went down and MJF got on top of him, put him fucking MJF's tights. That Before anybody was looking for this shit or knew what to look for, the guys were magicians with the blade. That's why that it was so long before anybody ever really knew about it. Because if a fucking guy nails you and then he, you're, all the fans are looking at the guy with the brass knuckles on his hand and you've gone down by the time you've taken your bump and turned over you've got your color and you don't need it anymore as soon as he gets on top of you stick it in the front of his fucking tights nobody's looking for you to they, it looks like you're trying to pull the guy off of you but nobody <laughs> number one if they did go over it with this guy the fact that they didn't tell him to immediately put it away when he was that unconfident of his swordsmanship to begin with and secondly there ought to be a producer in the, if they're doing what they went over beforehand, there ought to be a producer in the truck that's saying, do is shoot anything, but little Johnny dipshit there as he's about to go drilling for oil. So I loved the match and the angle. I couldn't believe. And as another Stace was sitting there and go laugh and go, look, I can see it from the hard camera. What's he doing? And again, not his fault, not Takeshita's fault. Well, part of it is that he wasn't any smarter than that to to not put it away and to... He was rolling around in the ring, repositioning it in his hand. I don't know what... Maybe he got it turned around and he didn't have his cutting edge marked. I don't know what the fuck's going on. Why hold it that long? I, I, so the, the angle for me was kind of spoiled, even though it was the right thing to do, get juice on the popular young baby face and have the challenger come down and save him. But I just, I couldn't look away. MJF, I don't know what you call it, shoving the referee? What was it? Pushing the referee? Whatever you want to say. He shoved him down. 
Last week, I think it was, we talked about a ref bump in a match, and we realized it's the only ref bump we could ever remember in any AEW match. And here we they are broke the next... that string shortly. Yeah, here we are the next week, and all of a sudden, here we go again. I mean, there's the time and the place. I don't know if this is the right one for that, but it's noticeable at least. Well, hopefully Tony's running out of his own finishes and he's letting some of the guys do some of theirs because some of his finish, if these are indeed have been his finishes are crazy, but at the same point, then the wrestlers finishes are crazy too, but they went from, you can never say we're not going to do something because you're at one point or another, you're going to do it. And there's a reason probably why at some point or another, there's a reason to do most anything. So the people that are in the wrong are the people that say we're either never going to do this or we're going to do this shit every week. And, and so they've said, we're never going to have DQs. We're never going to have ref bumps. Now they've had two and two weeks of, of ref bumps. And it's the same thing as they should have said, we're never going to have run-ins and we're never going to have backstage fights. And then we would have gone three years without run-ins and backstage fights, and now the first time they did one, holy shit, it'd, it'd fucking get over. But since the ref bumps they've done have been just kind of pissy and not really remotely even executed well or in a feature match that really needed it or called for it, now they've just withheld a ref bump all this time and then done enough to make people sick of them in two weeks because it didn't work. Should Tony issue an edict all future blading should be done under the ring? No, I think Tony should issue an edict that all future blading should be done by competent professionals that know how to do it. Because, I, you know, a couple of times that I got color, I went under the ring because I was scared people were going to see me because I wasn't very good at it because I didn't have a lot of practice. But for if you're going to be a goddamn main event wrestler that should be getting color, then you ought to know how to fucking do it. And, uh, you know, the, remember we called on uh, the, the time that Punk showed him how to do it, did it, but at the same time, you would have never known unless you knew what to look for. Maybe Chris Jericho's teaching the roster how to blade in front of the camera. It's sure not Harley Race, I'll tell you that. And, anyway. Hey, after this match, though, I said, hey, great match. Great open to the show. Great open to the show. We'll see how long that fucking lasts. And it was actually followed by a great little Samoa Joe package. He does a promo, but it's over uh, VTR of him beating up Darby and Wardlow. And, and Joe sounds great, looks great, looks like he means what he says. What a fucking heel. But do you want to see him against Wardlow again? Um, I'm particularly over that now. Cause where is Wardlow? Was he's is he bald now? He got his hair cut. We don't know what the no, fuck. Remember, he saved Darby. That's the next person that Joe's gonna oh, wrestle. Yeah that's, yeah, that's right. Who cares? They lost their chance. But speaking of losing a chance, they followed that great match, and uh, it, the angle was good. If you overlook the, uh, it, you know, I was like. It was like handing somebody a fucking ping pong ball and say, okay, do the fucking magic trick where the ping pong ball disappears, but it's somebody just off the street that doesn't know how to do the trick. And so I, I feel sorry for old take. But anyway, great match, angle, man, great promo, and then they come to the next match, the Bunny versus Jamie Hayter. And the bunny had the butcher and the baker and Penelope Pitstop and Pip Sabian all in her corner. And Jamie Hayter had Britt Baker and Reba. And I'm trying to figure out why well, yeah, the bunny was the heel because now the heels, the heel women in AEW are the originals instead of the WWE no. implants. But wait a minute. The bunny is an original AEW girl. Right. And and actually, Jamie Hayter wasn't originally an AEW. She came, but but now the story is. <laughs> so who's the heel here? Well, nevertheless, it doesn't matter, and we didn't have long enough to find out. They went a minute to the break. They came back from the break, and I was honestly zipping through this, but when I saw it ended so quick, I said, like, what the fuck? As soon as they came back from the break, Jamie Hayter hit 
one of those blockbuster suplexes, uh, Northern Lights, but with the trapping, the arm, whatever the fuck they call them, and went for another of what looked like the same one, and they just went backwards in a heap with the bunny underneath and Jamie Hayter falling on Bunny's head and face. And immediately, Bunny grabs her face and is hurt, and the referee's checking on her, and she ain't getting up. And she's obviously stunned or out or whatever, so Jamie Hayter, apparently they said she's hurt, so Hayter picked her up and then fucking clotheslined her right back down. <laughs> We're, and you could tell Bunny was trying to hang on and not take that bump right on the back of her head. So she hung on to fucking Jay, but Jamie Hayter drove her right down. So that's a perfect thing to do. Right after you've landed on someone's fucking face with most of your body weight, executing whatever move you were trying to do, jerk them up off the ground and then quickly whiplash them back down to the hard surface again. That'll generally... Snap them right out of it. One, two, three in less than a minute. So Bunny, apparently, they said on the internet afterwards, they thought she either had a concussion or a broken orbital socket. Yeah, one of those two things. So apparently, being a member of the AEW women's roster is slightly more dangerous than fighting the Ukrainian war. Well, you know how I feel. And, uh, you know, I think Hayter is actually one of the really talented people there. Hayter's one of those people when we talk about who would fit in in the ring with a Bianca and a Rhea, the top tier women of today and probably the next several years. Hayter's really good. Problem with the AEW women's division, who's she supposed to work with? That's really good. There aren't too many options. I mean, I couldn't really tell whose fault this was. It didn't look like Bunny left the ground on the second one. Like she did on the first one. They just kind of went over in a heap. But Jim, when you see the bunny come out there and do her little face, the whole little act, I don't know what it is. She's an evil bunny, I guess is the gimmick. But she's out there with a whole little clique of people who have been there since like the very beginning. Why are any of these people still there? Why are they still getting checks? Why? I mean, I'm, and I'm not trying to like say, hey, fire these people. You know, I hate to say that. But, I am. <laughs> but if these people mean nothing to the audience and they've been there for years now, you got to refresh everything. I mean, just, ah. But anyway, um, at least it didn't go too long. And, you know, the bunny reminds me of Stacy Keebler. She's a very pretty girl. Stacy Keebler's legs were too long. She wasn't built for the wrestling business. She got in the wrestling business to find a fucking husband, and then she traded up. The bunny, attractive young lady. But do I want to see her wrestle? What the fuck? I'd like to know what the injury rate is in the AEW women's matches. All kidding aside, if you actually took the amount of matches that the women's division has had and the amount of injuries, how many injuries per match? Well, let's go now back and and find out from two of the previously people that have been on the injured list. Renee Moxley-Good was in the back with Soraya and Tony Storm. Now, Soraya hadn't got hurt here yet. But she hadn't wrestled often here yet. And Tony Storm was out for quite a while with something, right? Well, but they're going to take care of the injuries. Because did you see this segment with Leva? I saw this and... Nobody was injured here. Except people's feelings. Yeah. And the business, maybe. Um, Soraya and Tony Storm now are over-the-top heels because of the booking this week. Uh, whereas they were, you know, lovely baby faces three weeks ago. And they bring in Leva, the girl with the blue hair who was one of the librarians with that fucking annoying looking emaciated fucking. He, what was his name? Goddamn. He Peter looked like Avalon. A, Peter Avalon. He looked like a porn star from the 70s if you deflated him. I think she's still a um, librarian, technically. In Gim- yes. Well, yes, because she's got her hair in the bun or whatever the fuck and the glasses on. And, They knock her down. And believe me, it wasn't that violent. And they gave her fake kicks, and she started doing fake selling. And then they were spray painting an L on her because she's a loser while she embarrassingly fake sold. And so what are you doing? 
I, I, there was better acting on Pornhub, and Leva couldn't make it on Pornhub either. But at least it might be a better, a closer chance than nice? a wrestling show. Will you be nice? Oh, come, that was embarrassing. Well, the acting it's was like, like they got some fucking girl from a fucking candy store down the street and said, "Act like you're hurt." Oh, what are you doing? Hey, listen, we're at a point now where even the most diehard AEW fans can't deny the major problems in the women's division. The problem isn't Tony not giving them enough time. The problem is the division sucks. The booking sucks. You have people doing shit like this that everyone knew was a bad angle. Everyone knew this was a bad segment, and it still got on TV. Why would you air that if you... Justify that Soraya contract to me. In what world was that a good signing? And in what world would you have not seen beforehand (laughs) that there's no way to justify that contract? Whatever. And in what world would you not have seen that you're turning the people on her? Well, her... She was turning she the people turned on herself, yeah. and they helped her. And uh, before they decided to actually make, oh, let's just make her a heel. Anyway, all right, let's talk about it. What do you want to talk about? The MJF- so what are you guys, I had no idea, by the way, years ago when we first started making fun of that, that that would somehow become his catchphrase. That would so be what do you thing. guys want to talk about? <laughs> He stuck with it by cracking <laughs> the MJF locker room promo. Um, on the first time that he was met with adversity, and this has been the subject of controversy and praise and criticism, and and a lot of those things all at the same time. This again was one of the more amazing verbal performances after this guy has gone out and had a 20 minute match. And shortly after that, he's in the locker room to come back and cut a promo like this, keep the people's attention on a pre tape. Cause you could tell the audience was listening. A, an incredible verbal performance with all of the, emotion and the inflection and the witticism and everything that you would want not just and verbal the, but, but even you know watching him the way he was yeah. performing it's not just the verbal performance yeah no but i mean the the emotion and the the movement and the, the whole day it was ge- the genuineness the sincerity and then of course and if anybody hadn't seen you got to see it there's no way we can recap it or you know even give any of the lines would not do it justice but the summation of the thing the bone of contention that would come up later was that mjf was talking about how the first time he was met with adversity was his the senior prom the big deal he goes out on a date and he ends up crashing the car and because he'd had a bunch of speeding tickets he takes the unconscious body of his girlfriend and switches places sticks her behind the driver's wheel before the cops get there so you know so imagine what i'll do to you type of thing right and apparently after this aired live on the on the program over 300 people called the Nassau, Nassau, Nassau County. It's called Nassau County. Nassau County. Well, I was going with Nassau County, Nassau County Police <laughs> Department. You were going with Nassau County. <laughs> Nassau County. I was <laughs> conflating. Nassau County Police Department to report that Maxwell Jacob Friedman had admitted, confessed to committing a crime in their jurisdiction like 10 years ago or whenever the fuck it was. And I've gone back and forth on it, and you and I talked about it off the air, and you thought, well, tell the people what you thought. I don't want to put words in your mouth. I thought the performance was spectacular. The intensity, and again, I don't think it's just, when you say it's a verbal performance, I think that almost means like you could just listen to it. I think you need to see it. You need to watch it. Yeah, yeah. I had several issues with it. My biggest one is just, I don't think it was necessary. And... I think it's cool that a heel can get the kind of heat today where people call call Nassau County or whatever you called it. Yeah, yeah. But whatever. Nassau County on Long Island, the police department there about this. But to me, first of all, I don't. This has to be the last time we hear about anything from MJF school years. I think that's it because we've heard about problems in junior high or high school. No yeah. more of that. You're too old. You gotta. Everything has to be in your twenties now. 
We're supposed to believe that MJF, this story, all of a sudden, this fantastical story that is ridiculous, and it's ridiculous that he would admit to the crime on TV. Yeah. To me, this felt more like a younger MJF who needed to establish himself as I'm a I'm the devil versus a guy that needs to establish himself versus Brian Danielson. He could do great intense interviews just about wanting to kick the shit out of Brian Danielson. I think this was, again, it was a great performance on its own, but in the middle of the wrestling show, in the middle of this feud, I thought it was an unnecessary step for where MJF is right now. And I, I personally, I think it's ridiculous. You know, at what point do you compare something to Katie Vick? You know, it's ridiculous, the idea that he was with this girl, she was blowing him, and then all of a sudden he switched places like he's fucking Kenny Powers or something. <laughs> well, no, that actually can be done. No, it can be but done. I don't I mean, want to talk about my high school years. Oh, come on. But uh, I you, agree. What you, what, you took Norm Dooley and you put him in the driver's seat? <laughs> he, he never got his license back after that. <laughs> But I no, I I agree with what you're saying that it sounded like a 23 year old MJF in MLW would say that because his prom was only like four or five years ago. But now he's a he's a bigger boy. He's a little bit older. I can see your point there. I can also see the point that it was a great performance on its own. Did it fit here? And that's why I went back and forth because. <sighs> First, and then I I was like you, the main thing is I was not offended by the subject matter or offended that he would do something like that or say he would do something like that. I was almost offended by, I think, the main thing was I always believe MJF. I always believe his stories. I always believe his sincerity and being the prick that he is. And my first thought was MJF is too smart to to confess to a crime on television, and therefore it makes me not believe this, and it it makes MJF seem a little fake, and he doesn't usually. That's what I thought. But then when I heard that three hundred and some people called the cops to fucking say he confessed, I'm like, well, shit. Now now that erases my biggest apprehension about the thing is that it sounded phony and people wouldn't believe it if apparently that many people believed it then he did something right because of his delivery it, it, and that's what i've said you can you can say almost any preposterous thing if people believe you and believe in the manner in which you're speaking they will buy it and it, it, did they believe this because of the goodwill from I won't say goodwill because of the credibility he'd built up from previous other times where he said the truth that they knew to be the truth, or did they just believe him capable of anything? I don't know. So I was back and forth on the whole fucking thing. And my main reason for not liking the whole deal was because I didn't think it was believable and a bunch of people really believed it in this day and age. So I don't know. I'm back and forth. I mean, there are people who believe that Mandy and Otis were a couple. I mean, you can't base things on what some people may believe. Again, I just thought it was an unnecessary step, and it was a step too far. I was even a little bit like, oh, really? That's where we're going with this? It just doesn't seem necessary. I just want to hear him cut promos on the guy he's fucking looking to take down. But, uh, I don't know. And I don't think this feud has done much to help Danielson. I think more needs to be done to make him other than the fact you want to cheer him because he's Danielson, there's nothing in this feud that's been highlighting him, really. Or am I wrong? Well, no, not you're not wrong because, well, again, they're doing, as we'll get into with the, uh, the next match on the program, they're doing constant angles where people have to fight umpteen people to get to the people. And most yeah. of the time they get to the people. Sometimes they don't. But it's kind of feeling like the same thing instead of centering on the issue between the two people. Yeah, that's one of the things I think people do need to talk to Tony about in general. Just no more, whatever you call them, eliminator, challenger matches. Like the bunny hater match, it wasn't just a match. It was, this is an eliminator match. If bunny wins, yeah. then she gets a title shot next week. Why? Just have a match. 
Well, speaking of, of if so and so does such and such, then they get who and who. Uh, the Garcia Guevara gauntlet match was up next, where Ricky Starks had to beat, and now they clarified it wasn't everybody in the Jericho appreciators. It was just three of the Jericho appreciators. It was just who showed up that day. Yeah, it was who showed up <laughs> and was in the building. So again. Poor Ricky Starks. He did such a great job of getting himself over, but then Tony noticed and decided to start using him, and then that's led to this booking. So Starks and Cool Hand Luke is first up, and they started with a sloppy fight, and did it, we never see Cool Hand Luke actually wrestle, thankfully, because now seeing him in tights and trying to work he looks like shit. The physique, the haircut, the tights, the face, it all screams, I'm a stock boy at adult world off the interstate. I mean, he did the worst shoot off I've ever seen. He just, he grabbed Starks like he was going to fucking grab him by the cheeks and kiss him. And he just flung his arms and Starks had to run to the ropes and then hit him with a one footed drop kick. But he made sure to slap his leg. Um, and then finally, in about two minutes, Starks hit a spear, one, two, three, but it was the worst Ricky Starks match I've ever seen because of the other guy. So now we've had a, we've had Starks beat a crummy job guy and look bad doing it. And then here comes Mac Daddy, Daddy Mac, swinging a miss and Starks rolls him up one, two, three. At least that was brief. And <sighs> did this look like goddamn... I hate to say it, but like local outlaw fucking television at this point, if somebody spent hundred thousand dollars on the production, this looks, uh, this looks like Ricky Starks got caught in the web of Jericho where you have so much energy going in and then you come out of it like a fucking can of tuna fish. The clout vampire. That's what they're calling him now. You see that? Yes. I mean, oh yeah, that's where I got it from, from people calling him that, including people in the business. It started with people in the business. Uh, yep. <laughs> so then Garcia and Guevara both come out. And the question is, who's it going to be? Number three, is it going to be Guevara or Garcia? And Garcia jumps him and we establish that. So now we're, we're still in the middle of this. You've heard of who's who of pro wrestling. It's who's that of pro wrestling. And Garcia gets heat on Starks, and the fans are chanting Sammy sucks because he's the only interesting person out there right now. And they go through a break. And they come back finally, and Starks, or finally, uh, Garcia gives Starks a superplex off the top rope, a full regular superplex off the top rope. Garcia gives to Starks. They take the bump. And then Garcia rolls through and goes to pick him up. And instead, Starks just picks him up and suplexes him for a two count. I'm like, what the fuck? Did you see that? How did that happen? The I can't, ex I can't explain it. And yes, I saw unfazed, it. And then just stood up and su suplexed the other. So I fast forwarded to the finish because this is rotten. It was making me not like Starks. So Starks was on the floor with Garcia. They were both selling there. And the referee's looking elsewhere. And as Starks stands up and leans over the barricade, a guy in a Milmoscaris mask in the front row gives, in quotation marks, gives him a Judas effect elbow and completely missed him with it. And that was a nice floor camera close-up. Did you see that one? Oh, of course. It may be Jericho. The back of Jericho's head may have grazed Starks's nose. <laughs> I'm not sure. But Starks sold it, went down like he was shot. And Garcia goes out there and rolls him into the ring and gets in the ring and covers him. Doesn't even do it. Remember, I always say they always do an extra move. Well, in this case, an extra move was called for. But 30 seconds after... The guy in the Mill Moscaris mask missed Starks with a move. Starks was still unconscious, and Garcia pinned him. Starks doesn't get his match with Jericho. And by the way, 
guess who got in the ring and took off the Mil Moscaris mask? And the announcers were shocked to see that it was Chris Jericho. And this was so bad they couldn't replay it. Starks just had to lay there and sell it, and they had to talk about what happened because they couldn't show a replay of what beat him because it was air. <sighs> it wasn't air. It was Jericho. This poor guy got super over. People couldn't wait to see him and MJF. Look at where he is today. Now, at some point, he'll beat Jericho, and they'll say, see, look what we've done. No. What you did is week after week of this shit, and now no one cares about Ricky Starks again. Well, speaking of nobody caring, uh, we're going to get there, but they had some words with Billy Gunn and the acclaimed in the back about their match with the Gun Club, the Ass Boys tonight, and Billy laid down the rule. He's going to stay in the back and let them handle the match and their business because he doesn't want to be involved, and they scissor. Have you noticed the acclaimed are now talking too much about how loved they are and how popular they are and how great they are? Because now it's starting to... They were, the, the, the people started liking the rap and they started liking the personality and they started liking the energy they had and they started getting over and then the whole scissor me thing happened and that was great, but the people didn't start loving them and making over them when they were talking about how great they are and how much the people love them. It's almost like now it's like, Oh yeah, now you're getting the big head kids. They should stay off of that to me. Do you see what I'm saying? When they're talking to their baby faces, unlikely baby faces that have been put in that position by popular fan acclaim should they be rubbing the fans' faces in it like they're the ones that did it, or should they still be, hey, we all you people, you love us because you have you and a little, not as stuck up. Get me out of this. To an extent, I agree with you, but I think in general there's been a big issue with managing the acclaimed once they got over. Once they established themselves in that Chicago matches, that was really where they established themselves as a team that fans would care about beyond the rap. I mean, they got the belts. Look at the booking of them since. The entire gun feud. And I like the guns. And we'll talk more about that later. Guns of potential. I don't want to say too much about that right now, but I like them. The problem isn't them as much as it's them right now. But this entire feud with the acclaimed and the guns has done neither team any favors. And the acclaimed look like shit throughout this feud. Just, there are times they're just standing around, they look like confused, like they don't know what's going on. And AEW had something. You just had to keep it simple. Well, you just had to keep it simple and not do can't. too much. <laughs> they they can't. They, well, well, we'll get there. Let's let's get the major hurdle out of the way first here. Coming up next, a reprise of a famous Clash of Champions angle from Cleveland. <laughs> Renee Moxley Good is in with the doctor and take a shit and Brian Danielson. And before anybody can speak except for Renee, the door slams shut to the office they're in and is locked and they can't get out. So Danielson's locked in the doctor's office and Rush comes out and then MJF comes out with his bad knee wrapped up, by the way, the one he missed the knee drop on. Brilliant. And he's still limping and selling. And he wanted to talk to referee Aubrey Ed. And she said, nay. Stop but he it. still talked to her. Be nice. Danielson's scheduled to wrestle, but he's not here. Ring the bell, start the match, count him out, that whole deal, right? As soon as she, okay, she rings the bell and starts count the split screen. There's Danielson crashing through the door, knocks it off its hinges, runs past the heels that are trying to stop him. And Aubrey Ed's counting slow on purpose. She'll pick up her hoof and she'll stamp it down on the mat. One. And then she'll wait. Then she'll Horrible. pick that hoof up and she'll stamp it down on the mat. It like that, right? Well, to be honest, she wasn't counting any slower than the usual AEW referee. Then counting. the usual. <laughs> yeah. so, so finally, Brian gets in the ring, makes it, and Rush gets on him. And at the top of the nine o'clock hour, we've got Brian Danielson in the ring and MJF on color. 
who knocked Tony and Sockface, by the way, thankfully. So Rush, I will say he's better than Andre Olio. Leo. Much better, I think. Much better. He got some heat on Danielson, but they they kept up a hot pace. And because Danielson was at a disadvantage from the start, he was fighting from underneath through the whole thing. And Rush, he ran his head, Danielson's head into the chair. And Danielson got cut. And here's the thing. I didn't see Brian's, but again, the, in the same program, it's it's constant. It, it's happened so much now with not only Moxley every week, but also the girls now. And now within the same, within less than an hour apart, there's two different people bleeding. It's not special. Any, it doesn't have the impact anymore. But nevertheless, uh, the one problem I had with this, and it's, you know, it's AEW. They stayed on the floor for a minute straight with Aubrey saying, either staring at him or saying, get back in. Then Rush would roll in and out and then beat Danielson up on the floor for another, like, one minute. I was timing this. But, again, uh, Danielson usually is able to have a modern match while still making it make sense and not bury the referee and et cetera. But the Lucha guys don't even think about the fucking rules and are never taught to look at Mexico. They do whatever the fuck. So this wasn't Brian's fault in this and that you can't get these guys to that. You can't get them to tag. You can't get them to recognize a count out a disqualification, burying a referee. It's not in their vocabularies. They're never even called on the carpet about it, but they went through a break. Brian kept firing back to make it fresh, but then he'd get shut down again. And finally, he was a bloody mess at the end, and finally he made the big comeback with the dive, and he beat up Rush on the floor, turned the tables, and the fans were with it, and he hit the missile drop kick, and they do the kicks, the chops, and the back and forth. And finally, Danielson hit the bukkake knee and got the two count, and then more forearms and chops. And one thing about Brian's, Brian Danielson should think about this better than anybody. Why is he doing headbutts? And I'm not talking about the safety issue because it's he's doing the headbutt. He's protecting himself, but everybody knows he had the problem with concussion. You would think as he tries to make things more legitimate than most people that he would take that out of his repertoire because people would know that he was if he had to retire because of concussions before, he would not be willingly headbutting another fucking guy if it was real right hey, if he cares about the realness of his matches no more taking a break in the middle of the match and all of a sudden slowing everything down so two guys could stand there and chop each other back and forth feeding each other to do it it's ridiculous well there's that also but anyway but at least when they were trading the chops brian sells and registers whereas rush either takes a bump or doesn't but there's nothing in between but finally uh Rush, German suplex, Danielson, Danielson rolled through, hopped up, hit the knee again, boom, one, two, three. It got a little tiresome at points. Rush has weaknesses. It wasn't as good as MJF and, and our friend take as a match, but it got the point across and it wasn't as bad as Brian Danielson and Brian Cage. Uh, but then MJF hit the ring and knocked out Danielson with the diamond ring and got the arm bar and cranked up on it. They actually sent some security that MJF nailed off the uh, apron with the ring and went back to the arm before they sent more security uh, and went to the break with them trying to pry MJF off. Rush had disappeared. And again, I know that, you know, a lot of modern producers or agents will say okay rush you're not in this angle now that you've lived your usefulness go away no he's the fucking guy to help keep the security off the apron while the big heel does the dastardly damage but he disappeared instead but that was fine what'd you think about this young man i thought it was a really good match other than you know again the one thing i hate that danielson does in almost every match moxley does in almost every match i thought it was a really good match actually i like the rush match maybe i even liked it better than the thatcher match I think Rush has been really. I think Rush has been the best opponent he's had in several weeks. I mean, he's had he wrestled Takeshita. Trying to he wrestled several guys, and I'm forgetting a guy or two. But I think Rush. This may have been my favorite of all those matches. 
I like Thatcher better than this one, but like I say, it was better than Cage and and actually better, you know. Than, Cage, that's who I was thinking of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, nevertheless. But then we go from partially sublime to completely ridiculous. You make me come. You make me complete. You make me completely miserable. The Buckaroos and Old Twink are back for the six-man title versus Top Flight and A.R. Fox. So now, I, we're not going to talk about the match. Obviously, it took 18 minutes of TV time away from the wrestling, but I'm sure the male cheerleaders in the audience got wonderful inspiration and cribbed a lot of fucking human pyramid notes. But more importantly, what is Tony getting for his money out of these alleged EVPs and main event guys? Okay, you could say when Twinkle Toes was in the world title picture, he was drawing main event, but not drawing main event money. He was getting paid main event money, but if he's in the world title picture, okay, you can justify that. The Buckaroos, they were in the tag title picture, supposedly the top team or one of them. All right, but now they're, they've got their own belts. There are no other real six-man teams. It's all just people put together. They get to play with their trampoline-trained friends like Top Flight and A.R. Fox that I'm sure are fine people and, you know, couldn't draw flies if you dipped them in shit. They're middle card guys. And now is this what the EVPs... Do they have to be over in the corner working with their own little friends or the, whether no matter their status on the card or they're going to be in a snit or is Tony just putting them on ice because he realizes that they, they're the root cause finally of this whole problem with punk and the cancer in the locker room is indeed coming from inside the house still. And he's just putting them over in the fucking corner. And it's not because just punk. They, they're they're not what are they involved in what are they contributing to except going out here and having the self-indulgent masturbatory six-man you know gymnastic choreography match with underneath talent that can flip for them they're drawing no money they're positioned to do nothing and the tag team division has fallen to complete shit now that FTR was diminished and demeaned and then sidelined and then went home after having the three best tag team matches in wrestling in the entire year in another company and not on their programming. So what are these fucking yahoos doing or what's Tony doing with them? Or is he just cooling them off so that they can slowly slink away? Well, there's a lot there. I think over the next couple of years, you'll start hearing more and more stories about other things that were happening in that locker room about who was really in their own locker room and clickish and just hurting other guys' careers. And You're talking about things that predated Punk's arrival. Predated and happened during Punk's time there. But since everything at all out, the Bucks and Omega have been back on the show. They came back, what, December or November? I forget, somewhere around there. They had seven matches with the Death Triangle. The Bucks are now doing this thing with Top Flight. I saw the list of AEW's merch movers. That was one of the big things for the Bucks for years. They were the biggest merch movers on the indies. They ain't moving that much right now. Have they ever meant less? Are people sick of their matches after seeing... If you've been watching AEW for the last six months, you're sick of the Young Bucks, just based off the fucking Death Triangle matches. You know what the match is going to be. Omega, maybe there's a reason he's not in singles action. Maybe he doesn't have someone he wants to work with right now. Maybe everyone's a diva and they're only going to work with who they want to work with. And you can't blame them because that's the way it's been since the beginning of AEW. That's what they've been allowed to do. Is Tony phasing them out? At this point, Tony only has limited things he can actually do with them. That's the other thing. What are you going to do? Are you gonna, here's a main event for pay-per-view, the Bucks versus the Gun Club. Mm -hmm. even the biggest Bucks fan who want them to reign the tag team division, reign over the tag team division, they wouldn't want to see them against the guns. They know that the Bucks would probably win. They wouldn't want to see that. 
So the Bucks don't mean anything in the tag team division. There's no one you really want to see them wrestle. And no one gives a fuck about the six-man tag titles. And the world champion is MJF because he's the the ratings champion. He's the verbal champion. He's the fresh face. Does anybody want to see MJF versus Twinkle Toes? And Tony spent so much time listening to Jericho and all Jericho's ideas that no one's gotten over from any of those Jericho feuds. So Jericho's still where he was, top of the card. No one else has been elevated. So MJF's there. Who does he have to work with? Even in a perfect world, if you like them, or whatever you want to say, Omega and MJF? I don't think anyone's really feeling that. Maybe Adam Page? And then who would call it? Yeah. It would, it would if, if Harpo called it, it would kill MJF. If MJF called it, Harpo wouldn't be able to execute it or keep up with it because he wouldn't understand it because it would make sense. And there wouldn't be flipping and flying and flopping. There would be wrestling. So it would suck from either direction, a complete clash of styles, and it would hurt the guy who's the future because the guy who was the past right now wouldn't be able to keep up with him. And by the way, so, and by the way, somebody's going to say, oh, what do you mean couldn't keep up with him? The old Kenny wrestles a lot faster than MJ. I'm talking about keeping up with him when MJF's calling trigonometry and Old Twinkle Toes is over in the corner going two plus two. That's that kind of keeping up with it. Go ahead. When Kenny Omega was last seen in AEW, he was the world champion. He reemerges. The only times we've seen him is in six-man tag action. He has to do whatever he can to get himself to the ring physically to do that. Again, there's only a limited amount of things you could do with him right here. He just had that big match a lot of people liked with Will Ospreay. It's for another company. It was in a Tokyo Dome. It was a different guy. There's only so much to be done with the Bucks and Omega right now. I hate to say it, but doing something with Punk may be one of the few things that would get anyone to care about them right now. Oh, now that would be pay-per-view main event level stuff. If you had Punk on one side and any of the Buckaroos and their gang on the other side, that would draw money, especially from that audience. But they're too selfish to do it they would have to admit they fucked up and they would have to do some apologizing and they would have to probably endure a uh, demotion out of their EVP fucking status. They're good Christian boys. I'm sure they'll ask for forgiveness and say, I'm sorry, it was my fault. I shouldn't have stormed into your locker room. Right? <clears throat> so, Stokely. Let's talk about Stokely. He was in the back. And there are cracks in the firm. And Stokely was dressed better, and he did a good promo about Hook. And then, of course, Hook walks up behind him conveniently on camera, and he turns around and says, Hey, buddy! And Hook cranks his arm and says something to him, which I couldn't understand and didn't care about, and walked off. And it, again, they've made Stokely an underneath comedy figure already. We don't know... We don't know why he's there, what his motivation is, who his group is, and uh, with any certainty, it like it, he's a step ahead of Prince Nana and that Nana's a manager that is yet to speak on the television program. But all these managers, they give plenty of time to that fucking fake lawyer, Mark Sterling, and every time he talks, it runs people off because it's so fake. But I've said before, and I'll say it again, and we'll move on. You can take a top manager and give him an underneath talent that you want to push, and that will work. Or you can take a main event talent and introduce a new manager, and the main event talent will elevate the manager. But you can't have a manager that nobody knows the backstory of, where they came from, what they're doing, or what they're supposed to be doing, along with a bunch of intermittent mid-card talent, or elsewise, it's just a clusterfuck, and nobody gets over. And that's what they've done. The whole Hardy family thing, the Sterling bunch, Stokely's bunch, whoever the fuck Nana's with. None of this makes any sense. When when I managed someone during my managerial career after the Midnight Express, they were generally top names and drew money in whatever spot they were in. And I know somebody's going to say Mantar. Yes, it was a rib. It happened about twice, but I'm talking about the Midnight Expresses or the Heavenly Bodies or the British Bulldog or Owen Hart or Vader or Yokozuna. 
not only did I have a track record as a top manager and people got it, but I was placed with top talent. And in, in some cases, when somebody might switch, uh, heal or whatever, they'd be placed with me to get them some extra heat or whatever the case. But you don't just put together meaningless people with each other and expect somehow the sum of the parts to be greater than the whatever the fuck. They've done but now, they've done so, Stokely no favors. He's no. shown a lot of talent despite the way he's been used since the very first time he arrived in AEW. So we'll figure it out sooner or later what he's doing there and whose side he's on and what he wants. But we come to the main event where we're not going to be able to figure anything out. The long-awaited tag team title match, The Acclaimed versus The Gun Club. And Caster came out. It did his rap even in English and Spanish because they were at El Paso, and that's, well, that's just swell. And I'm, I don't want to critique this match step for step because at the start, I wrote, okay, a lot of green here and no apparent leader. And we've talked about it. The acclaimed got over big through circumstances, their own work, their personalities, etc. But they're not to a point where they're able to take care of themselves in the ring in a long competitive match yet without looking green unless they have good leaders, experienced veterans. And then the guns are in the same position. We've talked about how much potential they have. And how there's something there, but they're green, they're inexperienced, this is their first TV spot. They're still a little awkward. They're awkward puppies that haven't got their feet under them yet to become the fucking greyhounds they're going to become. And this is a fast acceleration into this spot with this kind of spotlight for them. So this match that it was happening was not fair to either team and was not going to highlight either one of these teams in their best light. It just wasn't. So it, and it's not their fault. And they worked their ass off and tried very hard and, and they're very good for this level. But it brought up, you know, this, this should have been on Ohio Valley wrestling television for the OVW tag team title on local TV in three markets. And then the same for guys that have been in the business between six months and two years. And then it would have gotten all, all kinds of praise. I'm not actually OVW's tag teams in the 2003, 2005 era were farther ahead on basics at this point than any of these guys are, but it's not their fault because the OVW guys got more consistent training from a variety of people and also worked in front of an audience at least three or four days a week. So, unfortunately, as we mentioned earlier in the program, because the acclaimed getting over on their own because the people were bored with the fucking rotten tag team booking and they liked the personalities and the rap and et cetera, and the guns have that, that heelish kind of charisma that they've got that they show and they work hard with their bumps and everything. So the people put them in this position because of bad booking and no leadership at the top. And now they had to have a main event tag team title match on national television following, you know, these people have seen a lot of tag team talent, but FTR sitting at home waiting to get out of their contracts. The buckaroos are playing with their friends. What tag teams are left in this company that's supposedly rich in great tag teams. They signed Mike Bennett and Matt Taven. We've yet to see them. If this had been Taven and Bennett against the acclaimed, then the acclaimed would have looked great. Or if this was FTR against the guns, the guns would have looked great. But it was acclaimed against the guns, and they all looked like a bunch of fucking green thumbs. But anyway, uh, they did the referee bump where gun, one of the guns pulled the referee in front of Bowens' elbow, and the referee did take a nice bump. But then, again, and I don't know who the agents are on the finishes. I don't know if the agents are getting overruled on the finishes. I'm mortified that anybody that would claim to have experience in wrestling 
approved this finish. Austin Gunn gave uh, Bowens a hip toss of some discre hip toss or some kind of little slam, and Bowens laid there for 25 seconds. Well, Austin went out and got the tag team belt, came back in, and stood there threatening to hit a man who was face down and not moving on the mat. If you have done something to where that the guy that you're wrestling is incapacitated, face down, on the mat, not moving, why did you have to go out and get the fucking belt? <laughs> and why are you waiting for him to stand back up so you can hit him with it when you could just hit him when he's down? He's already unconscious. He's not going to fight back now. But Billy Gunn came out and helped Bowens up and then Austin Gunn swung the belt, but Billy grabbed it and took it away and dropped it on the mat and told his son off and left. And then Colton, or didn't leave, he told his son off, but Colton, the other son, grabbed the belt and nailed his father, Billy, from behind. Meanwhile, Bowens was still down selling that goddamn hip toss or whatever it was for over a minute. And then once they did the business with Billy, because that was their swerve, everybody thought, well, they're going to really fuck this up and Billy's going to turn and join his kids again. Well, he didn't do that. He just said he wasn't going to get involved. Then he came down and got involved, and then he was not a fucking factor. But then they got into a sloppy four-way, and Caster hit the elbow off the top and went out to pick up the referee's dead body because the referee by that time had been out on the floor for from one elbow strike for over two minutes and no other referee had come in. Remember I always say on referee bumps, your clock is ticking. You're at a heist movie. You're robbing a bank. That little counter in the fucking bottom of the corner of the screen before the fucking bomb goes off. Whatever. Boom, boom, boom. Get your shit done and get out. A new referee is going to be coming once they find out what's going on or the old one's going to be getting up. Or somebody else is going to be coming, so get your business done. No. He goes out, he rolls the referee's dead body in. The referee counts two. The other gun outside pulled Bowens off the cover. And Bowens got up and fucking tried to do something about that. The other gun came, he rolled the gun up. The other gun, the gun that he rolled up kicked him off. He did a 90-degree turn off the roll-up. And the other gun hit him and hit, again in quotation marks, with the belt in the head, but it looked like shit because he didn't hit him, and Bowens fell backwards, and the other gun pinned him. And where did Billy go? He didn't come back till after the whole thing was over with, and then he was concerned. It was a rotten, too confusing finish. It was not executed well. With two green teams, it didn't do neither one any favors, and the acclaimed got beat for their belts after only having them for several weeks with a finish that was obviously fake because the belt shot looked like shit, and everybody on this weekly program takes harder hits than that and kicks out at one if they're even covered. Ha! Huh, and the acclaimed is now in trouble. Yeah, you're not even addressing what I think is one of the biggest issues, which is that. This did no one any favors. This didn't do the guns any favors with no. the AEW fans. No. Because it was doomed from the start. Because the Tony let the people book this because he didn't have control of it and he wasn't sending the people in the direction that he wanted them to go. And that's what a booker does. You don't give the people what they want. You give the people what you want them to want. And if you're good, you make them want it. Because you know you can give them what you want them to want. Sometimes you might not be able to give them what they want. So make them want something else. This has been a WWE tag team feud. From the bad angles yeah. to... It's not even just, you know, the bad segments and everything. Just the content of it. Just the ridiculousness of it. And then this. And this finish. You could tell the fans weren't happy with it. I think a lot of AEW fans, a lot of people watch that show, reacted the same way I did. I just said, oh, no, because I like the guns. This isn't about them. It's about them getting the tag titles right now. And, boy, this tag team division, when it first started, and they put the belts on SCU, which was such an interesting maneuver, everyone said, oh, look at this tag team division. And then you have the Bucks. They're not even the, the champions yet. 
Jurassic Express showed some promise, FTR came in. Look at this tag team division right now. And this decision, the other thing is, the way I reacted, the way I think a lot of fans reacted to this, the anger I've seen online from a lot of people about this, I would have told you that would have been the reaction if you had asked me before it. I think we did. <laughs> no, but I'm saying like if if Tony Khan was booking this and he didn't realize this is the way people would take to this, that's a problem because it was obvious. Well, what were the ratings on this fiasco this week before we move on? Let's go over the ratings right now, Jim. For Dynamite, which aired on February 8th, 2023, the overall number was 899,000 viewers. Mm. Right, we're going in the wrong direction, apparently, again. Back down to the, uh, to the base audience. But uh, what, was, what were the quarters there? Oh, great, Brian. The quarters. Let me open this up right now. This was put together by Brandon Thurston at WrestleNomics. The show opened, or maybe I should say the Big Bang Theory ended. <laughs> Segment one, Takeshita vs. MJF 8 to 815, 1,049,000 viewers. So that's, I believe, comparable to where they started out last week. The overall number, I think, is comparable. What was it last week, 901? No, la no last week was nine, was better, was it? Was it only 901? Maybe I'm thinking of the week before that. I am, because that was they had Mark Briscoe on that week. So they, right. people, some people went to see. All right, so the first quarter hour, 1,049,000. Segment two, which is the finish of MJF versus Takeshita, as well as the post-match angle, the Samoa Joe backstage promo, and the Bunny versus Jamie Hayter <laughs> with picture-in-picture, picture, as well as... The okay. Tony Storm, Soraya, Leva Bates backstage angle. One million viewers. Okay, that is telling in that they only lost 49,000 people from the start of the Big Bang. And that's unusual. That's unusually small. That tells me people stuck around to see what was going on with MJF there. They certainly didn't stick around for the bunny. Segment three, 830 to 845. The MJF blowjob switcheroo story promo, <laughs> as well as Angelo Parker and Daniel Parker. Angelo Parker. And How about Dan Angelo Mosca? Angelo, I wish. Angelo Parker and Daniel Garcia and Matt Menard versus Ricky Starks in a gauntlet match with picture in picture. 941,000 viewers. All right. So we begin the attrition. We've lost another uh, 59,000. Segment 4, 8.45 to 9 p.m. The final seven minutes of the gauntlet match, as well as the post-match with a masked Chris Jericho, the acclaimed and Billy Gunn backstage promo, the Danielson being locked in the dressing room or locker room, and Takeshita Angle, and MJF's live promo, 869,000 viewers. Ooh. Boy, howdy. So that was... 180,000 people from start of the first hour to finish of the first hour. Well, let's go to the... And, oh, I man. was about to say, at top of 9 o'clock, Brian Danielson is coming to the ring to wrestle. So did that help him out any? Top of the hour, segment 5, 9 to 9.15 p.m. Brian Danielson versus Roosh with picture-in-picture, picture, 923,000 viewers. Okay, so they picked up... 54,000. Indeed, they did. Indeed, they did. Yes, I was looking at that. The mathematics are correct. So they lost... <laughs> they lost 180,000 from the start of the first hour to the end of the first hour, but then at the start of the second hour, they picked 54 of those thousand back up. Well, segment 6, 9.15 or 9.30 p.m., the Danielson-MJF post-match angle as well as the Impractical Jokers backstage angle. Oh, I forgot about that. And the Elite versus AR Fox in Top Flight with Picture in Picture. 848,000 viewers. Oh, Jesus. So they not only lost 
all the ones they just picked up, but they lost another 21,000 on top of that. So about 75,000 viewers. Well, segment seven, 9.30 to 9.45 p.m., the final nine minutes of the Elite vs. AR Fox and Top Flight. Oh, good God. The Hook Stokely Hathaway segment. And that's it there. 779,000 viewers. Jesus Christ. So uh, they've already lost exactly, no, t not exactly 200, the 201,000 people from the start of the program through quarter six. But when the people get a shot of the six man champions, they lose another 69,000 people in 15 minutes time. Well, the final segment, Jim, segment 8, 9.45 to 10 p.m., the acclaimed versus the guns with picture-in-picture picture and the post-match, 780,000 viewers. And the main event loses another 19,000. Is that a good sign when all three of your executive vice presidents get 18 minutes of the television time to do what they want playing with their friends, and in that 18 minutes of time, they managed to run off 69,000 more people than you've already lost to the program thus far. They ran off 30% of the people had been run off by that point by themselves. CM Punk never did that. No, I, I mean, they're in rarefied territory now. When you talk about records being set, I think it's safe to say that the elite are running off more viewers than pretty much anybody else in AEW television history. The elite in the women's division. And here's the other thing. Other than the fact that WWE would sign them just to stick it to AEW, what leverage do these guys have right now? They've never meant less. They haven't meant less in a decade. Than and do I, don't think, I don't think they're smart enough to realize it. I think they still think that they're the, the, the brains behind that operation and they're the straw that stirs the drink, as Flair would say. I don't think they realize how irrelevant they are fast becoming in the ever-changing wrestling world. Because after all, their, their little YouTube comedy show, those numbers are down. They don't do anything like our numbers, for example. So their relevancy... Hey, hey, look at the fucking television number. More people listen to you talk about them last week than actually watch them. Than actually watch them wrestle. So, I, you know, I hate it when people, people like that, formerly living on the island of relevancy, now become completely irrelevant. Almost like they're out of touch, Brian. The buckaroos and twinkle toes, they're out of touch with what the people want, or elsewise they'd have listenership numbers and viewership numbers like ours. But, well, it's not my business, not for me to interfere. And you would think they would be in touch from all the touching of themselves that they do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they they touch themselves plenty. They just can't touch anybody else. Well, there was the ratings, and uh, say, how do you rate this week's programming on the Arcadian Vanguard Network and the Wrestling News broadcasts? Another action-packed week on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Get information about all the shows on Twitter, at Super Podcasts, or on Facebook at facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. A few notes. Of course, the Wrestling News. Subscribe today wherever you find your favorite podcast. Look for Arcadian Vanguard's The Wrestling News or download directly from thewrestlingnews.com for your free daily morning wrestling newscast. No opinion, no conjecture, no star ratings, just actual wrestling news. No Get charge. It. No charge. Free. Daily. Get it today. TheWrestlingNews.com or look for The Wrestling News wherever you find your favorite podcast. I want to once again mention the latest episode of Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon, Keith Elliott Greenberg, discussing the life of Lanny Poffo. A lot of people have really liked this episode. Check it out today at SUAWPod.com or look for Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And of course, The 605 Super Podcast. The Ship. Is that you? Is that you whining? <laughs> go through the archive today. It's, go through the archive today at 605pod.com. Available wherever you whine, your favorite podcast. Wherever you whine, your favorite podcast. The Mothership! Can I have some cheese with that, please? 
Uh, so before we talk about this past Friday nights, well, this last nights, wherever the fuck we're at in this time warp, SmackDown, the one for February 10th, the big one, the big uh, bloodline blowout show from last week, we've been talking about the trend lately, it seems, is for wrestling programs to lose their audience the, the, the longer they go on. It, they tend to wear on people, apparently, and drive them away. But in this case, probably due to the bloodline, uh, that, was, uh, that trend was broken. And uh, again, this thing's hot, and, and the WWE now is again doing some TV numbers. I did the 30th anniversary Raw, but do you have the... Because I can't read the fine print on this fucking thing. I can, I can follow the big numbers, but do you have the February 3rd SmackDown ratings in front of you? You should. You sent them to me. Uh, I have to pull that up, but uh, give me a second. Well, pull, pull on that for a minute. See if you can get some blood Ow! in it. Ow! Yeah, oh, there. Oh, see, you need to use that thing every once in a while. It gets sore then if it's called into service. Why'd you tell me to pull on it? Well, I didn't mean yank. Fuck. But anyway, while you're pulling those numbers, or whatever it is you're yanking, uh, again, the uh, SmackDown on February 3rd is what we're talking about before we discuss what they followed it up with. And boy, I, that'll teach those people to tune in on the 3rd if they came back this week with what they followed it up with. But anyway, have you pulled enough yet? I got the quarter hours. I'm trying to find the overall number, actually. I don't have that in front of me. Does that answer your question? Well, we're talking about the quarters. Okay, I have the quarter hours. That's what we're talking. We're talking about the quarters. Well, I have we ain't talking about the dollars. Well, I have them right here. We'll talk about dollar in a minute. But yes, the 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 trend was very. Uh, 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 actually, they hardly ever through the program lost anybody, and they gained at the end. Go ahead, tell me what they did. These were compiled by Brandon Thurston at WrestleNomics. Quarter 1, 8 to 8.15 p.m., which is a recap of everything happening with the Bloodline, as well as Braun Strowman and Ricochet versus Imperium, 2,385,000 viewers. And that ain't bad. And that continues into Quarter 2, which is more of Strowman and Ricochet versus Imperium, 8.15 to 8.30, million. 390,000 viewers. They actually got 5,000 extra people as a result of whatever they did in the <laughs> first part of the fucking match. But I mean, again... They had a competitive we, match. That's what they did. Well, yeah, we, we've been following the AEW numbers for so... We're just used to that massive drop after the first 15 minutes because... But, but these people are not big bangers. They they didn't they didn't just hang out because of the big bang that was on in front of them. This is actually network television, and and they came there apparently on purpose. Continue quarter three eight thirty to eight forty five p.m., which is the Charlotte Flair Sonya Deville backstage angle, as well as Rey Mysterio and Judgment Day. I think it's the NASCAR video they did. Two million three hundred forty seven thousand viewers. So they dropped forty three thousand, which at uh, this level of viewership is about, what, 5%? Well, quarter four, Charlotte Flair versus Sonya Deville and a Cody Rhodes video, 8.45 to 9 p.m., 2 million 413,000 viewers. So while their girls' matches are going on, at least if it's Charlotte in this case, uh, they pick up viewer in that case, 53, 60, about uh, almost 70,000. You know, you say, even if it is Charlotte, not that Sonya has been used well or anything, but is there anyone in AEW on the women's roster that's been used as well as Sonya has been used in WWE? No, <laughs> no. well, and also uh, when you look at Sonya's matches, you know, she's, She's better than 90% of the AEW women's roster. It's just that she's not at the in-ring at the top level of the WWE women's, but she'd own the AEW women's roster. So again, we're talking about grading on this curve or whatever. Well, let's go back to this curve here. Quarter five, nine to 9.15 p.m., the big nine o'clock hour, 
which is the bloodline backstage angle into the Viking Raiders versus the Brawling Brutes, 2,385,000 viewers. And again, they stayed mo- They lost less than 30,000 viewers over the top of the uh, 9 o'clock hour, and at that 30,000 out of almost 2.5 million, that's normal fluctuation of people taking a piss at that point. You know, we did Raw ratings last time, this time SmackDown, and it's a little different because we can kind of compare it, even though it's very different, it's a very different animal, we can compare it a little better to AEW Dynamite's to a two-hour show. We're about to get to quarter six. This is usually where things start going down and you kind of have to hope they recover for AEW. But here, let's compare it. 9.15 to 9.30 p.m., which is six minutes of the Viking Raiders versus the Brawling Brutes. <laughs> and whatever that post-match was, I don't remember, with Sheamus and Drew McIntyre, two million. Oh, two- yeah, I, 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 re- I remember it was, oh, God. That was the uh, the whole deal where they were out and bashing each other off of the uh, railings and et cetera. Go ahead, I'm sorry. 2,282,000 viewers. And that's a drop of 103,000, which is the biggest drop so far in the program, and that's the lowest viewership of the program yet, and they are still only 103,000 down from the start of the program, which is, again, you know, like 5% of this number. Quarter 7, 9.30 to 9.45 p.m., which is a women's four-way featuring Natalia. Bo versus Zelina Vega versus Shayna Baszler versus Shotzi, who has no last name anymore, as well as a bloodline backstage angle, 2,285,000 viewers. They even picked up 3,000 people on that ladies four-way, I guess uh, in anticipation of what was going to happen at the end of the show with the bloodline. Quarter eight. But, uh, oh, again, no, no, I just, again, no change. Quarter 8, 9.45 to 10 p.m., Roman Reigns, I think he did a live promo and Sammy attacked him. That's what it was. So the big angle with the bloodline. 2,588,000 viewers. They picked up 300,000 people for the last 15 minutes of the program, and that was the, at 9.45 to 10 o'clock Eastern, was the highest rated segment of the show by over 200,000 people. That, that, that's tremendous. There's a lot to try to figure out about that. You think, I mean, people were just hovering around the episode waiting for the big thing. I mean, everyone wanted to know this is the first SmackDown after the Royal Rumble. Everyone kind of wanted to see what was going to happen with the bloodline. I mean, what do you think this, num- what do you think causes this number? Is it just star power? Is it anticipation for what's next? What is it? I, th- I th- I think that um, a little bit of all of that, but basically they were interested in what was going to happen. Uh, this was the SmackDown after the Rumble. They wanted to know what was going to go on with this. And remember, when we say, okay, they gained 5,000 or they dropped 30,000 or they picked up 70,000 or whatever, those are not the exact same people. And th- And again, television... Rating, metrics, uh, measuring, yardsticks, whatever. It can't be exact because not everybody's being monitored. That's that's the government's job. But it is the formula that they've come up with now with their advanced computers and everybody that's wired in. It's not somebody sitting at home writing everything down in a fucking little booklet and sending it in for a dollar like it was in the 70s. But people naturally change and go back and forth or they call somebody or whatever, get on your telephone. And so the buzz over the course of this program from the people checking in and out had to be, yeah, we know the and Roman Reigns is there, this stuff is developing uh, by the end of tonight, and they're smart enough now to the fucking SmackDown format that the, the the main event is usually not a match, but that's the big interview segment and angle with the stars that they were hiding out and waiting for it. What do you think this says about what we have seen where 
you know, again, especially with AEW, just because we monitor those, this isn't the pick on AEW. You could probably use this example for WWE at times too. People dive off in the second hour and they don't come back. There's nothing that makes them say, I got to return to that show to see that main event or whatever it may be. Or maybe they say, I can wake up tomorrow and watch this on DVR or just go to YouTube. What do you think something like this still says about making people want to see something live so that they can't do that? They can't wait until tomorrow. They can't wait to go on YouTube an hour later or whatever it may be. They want to see it in the moment as it happens. Yes, because they don't want it to get spoiled for them or they don't want to, you know, if it, it, something's going to fuck up or I won't be able to see it tomorrow. All right, they just want to know what's going to happen. And that's the way that, you know, traditionally television viewing was in the before you could pick and choose the time that you could see everything and blah, blah, blah. And again, this is primetime network television or primetime television, 8 to 10 p.m., uh, so you're not fighting sleep for the majority of the country at that point. When you get start getting to 11, that's where you start. And that was the phrase they used to use in television, fighting sleep. That's why in the, in the 80s, when Vince got the NBC deal, Saturday night's main event, that was 1130 to 1 a.m. on Saturday night in the Saturday night live time slot, what, every couple months or whatever. That's why the main event would go on, be in the ring and happening before the midnight hour. They would, they might do something. Sometimes it was first. They might do something to set it up first or interviews or whatever. But Hulk Hogan or whatever the main event was, was going to go in the ring then. And then they had other feature matches to fill out the time. But by you got, by the time you got to one in the morning, you know, it was a, a fucking rib because you had lost a significant portion of the audience, you're fighting sleep. And that was his formula for that. But at 8 to 10, if you're not only, if you've got a program where people are interested in what the fuck's going on with your main talent, but you format it correctly on a regular basis, there isn't a reason why you ought to lose viewers. Because you're not fighting sleep. You're fighting in fucking difference at that point if you're losing viewers. You know, the one thing about the Attitude Era that I think does hold up in a sense is that it was a period of time where people couldn't wait to see what was going to happen next. Yeah. For one reason or another. So you saw, you know, I'm sure if we evaluated those quarter hours right now, people just had to see what was going to happen next. When is Steve Austin going to show up on this episode? Whatever yeah, well, it may be. It, and it was the same with the Clash of Champions on TBS. In uh, from the uh, WCW days and from the Crockett days, the main event, whatever time period is broadcast, would be the highest rated uh, part of the program because in those days, people uh, the the formatting was such that people knew that the advertised main event was going to go on this show last, whatever time it was. They weren't going to, you know put it on whether we did a couple of afternoon clashes, but a lot of them were eight to 10, you know, Eastern time, but they knew that flair was going to be against whoever starting at nine 30. And that's, and the, uh, Greensboro match with sting went from, what was it? Uh, three o'clock in the afternoon till five 30, but they still had goddamn however many millions of people watching at the end because they knew it was going to be on the main event. So it's uh, it, it also, it's somewhat of a self-fulfilling prophecy when you not only have main events that people don't really want to see, but you, uh, in a lot of cases, give them a eh, main event and then a, a fucking interview segment that they don't really care about. In this case, they did, but sometimes they don't, and that shows drop or whatever on the WWE side. Tony never gives us a main event interview segment because uh, the only one of his guys could talk main event level would be MJF and he'd be standing there talking to himself. Tony never makes you wait till 945 to see what you've been waiting for all night. Whether that's good or bad, yeah, you know, no. someone else could debate. But <laughs> no. you know, seriously, usually you get something in the first segment or nine o'clock. You're not going to get it at the very end, yeah. typically. He, he, he gives you the blowjob first and then you've still got to go to the movie and hold hands. Maybe that's why interest wanes. But hey, before we go to this week's SmackDown, I thought in the spirit of ratings, because we've been talking about this, 
And I said, well, let me just see something because I have specific ratings for Ohio Valley Wrestling Television. And I thought I would see for my own because I keep preaching, well, they used to stick around for the goddamn main event, right? Didn't lose viewers. And I thought, let me look at this two different ways. I've got one of the two-hour primetime specials that we did, the debut of our new Davis Arena event, Fall Brawl 2022. Or 20, shit. 2022? Let me try that again. 2220. And hut, hut, no, 2002. That's what I'm trying to say. The Fall Brawl 2002, where our program aired here on Saturday night, 8 to 10 p.m., and then I got another example where we were in our normal time slot Saturday night at 11 p.m. for one hour. And I, th- I just let I would. Are so you're you fighting sleep. This at all. So you're fighting sleep in your you're normal time slot. 11 to midnight. Yes. In a normal time slot. But we for- still formatted the program that the best thing you're going to see on television is a main event and that's coming on last. And we would advertise it and or talk about it through the program, but nevertheless, and with the, the one hour program, but also at this time, this is uh let's see, this was for May 22nd, 2004 is this one, because I had a, a another comparison. I wanted to bring up the WWE at that point, they still did syndicated television. And I guess what was their main syndication that there were only maybe syndication by that point? It was still Superstars, right? I'm not sure when Superstars went off the air, but that was their main show for many years. But basically, the WWE, uh, uh, were they WWF still in 2004? Nevertheless. No, they were E. Okay, they were E by then. Well, they had their syndicated program that they still did on stations across the country here in Louisville on another station. Big 58, and we were on WBKI. Now, Big 50, WBKI was, you might have guessed, one of the WB affiliates. When the, we, we, remember we got all those networks, to uh, that two- or three-year period where they started about 18 new networks? UPN, WB, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, we got, were the WB station, and Big 58 was the UPN station. And they actually, that was the first network that SmackDown debuted on. But for purpose of this exercise... This is the WWF or WWE syndicated program. They were on Big 58, and I believe they were on Saturdays around, God damn it, when was it? Saturday during the day. And we were on Saturday night at 11 o'clock. But still, I, I used to sometimes jot their numbers down as well as ours to compare. So we had our show that we were shooting at that point on uh we had graduated from super vhs and and hopped all the way up to the the brand new stuff the, where we got the used beta cam equipment our overall number was a 1.8 with a 3.0 share in 11,000 homes hey, on can this I, particular night can yeah. i stop you for a second we talk so much about ratings on this show but usually we're talking viewership numbers to the listener at home who doesn't know what that means and 1.3 meant different things at different times what would that have meant? A 1.8 rating, and this is local television, by the way. I saw some complete moron. So when we were talking about OVW ratings and Smoky Mountain ratings one time, he'd listen to the clip and he'd tweet, well, how can you say that you did a one rating? Well, Tony Khan, that would be a goddamn six million people or whatever. Not national rating, you dumb shit. There are also local ratings for every television station in every market in the country to see how they compare in that market with the other stations, blah, blah, blah. And so a 1.8 means still basically of every 100 television stations in this particular market, 1.8 of them are tuned to... The wrestling show, but a 3.0 share means that's the share of homes using television at that point in time that are currently viewing the program. Did I explain that for the layman correctly? I think so, yes. And in the Louisville market, a a 1.5 
uh, to a 1.8, depending on the time of day, is around about 10,000 homes. And as we've mentioned, the way they used to measure it, because this is 20 years ago, you got credit for about, at that point, it was like 1.5 or 6 people per home because obviously not everybody's sitting there watching by themselves. It's not like now where they watch wrestling like a porn, like a dirty secret. And back in the 70s, it was like two and a half people per rating or per home because uh, nobody had the television in every room by that point yet. So anyway, with that having been said, our quarter hours for this particular Saturday night from 11 p.m. to midnight. First quarter was a 1.4 rating with a 2.1 share in 8,000 homes. Second quarter, 1.6 rating, 2.7 share, 10,000 homes. Third quarter, 1.9 rating, 3.4 share, 12,000 homes. <laughs> You're picking up homes. And fourth, fourth quarter, 2.2 rating, 4.2 share, and 14,000 homes. And honestly, I attribute and usually attributed that to the point where the local news that a lot of people, if they're watching local television, tune into went off at 1130. And then remember the show Maximum Exposure? It was one of those, you know, chaos video, home video and security video. Oh, my God. And cars are crashing and everything. It was our syndicated program. That's what we were opposite on the Big 58. We used to beat the shit out of maximum exposure. Obviously, we would come in behind the NBC, CBS, ABC, and Fox affiliate. We were generally number five of a seven-horse race, but every once in a while, we'd beat the fucking ABC station, too, and that would tickle the cockles of my heart. Uh, but me, so we went from uh, a 1.4 rating and 8,000 homes in the first quarter to 2.2 and 14,000 homes in the second quarter. Overall, had a 1.8 with 11,000 homes. Now the WWE syndication that they spent a a lot of money on still in those days. Obviously, they were in the daytime, so their numbers are a little bit different as far as the home level. The hut level, that homes using television, used the hut level they used to talk about. Uh, but they basically did a 1.5 rating, lower than ours, but a 4.1 share because there were fewer people watching television at that point, and 10,000 homes. And they did pretty flat quarters, 1.6 and then three 1.5s and 10,000 homes and then three 9,000s. So we, on an, you know, I, I'm not saying this is typical or not. This is the one I opened the book to. But we beat the WWE syndicated program on another local station in the, the ratings there. And don't worry, they got revenge in the end. They took all your top stars and cut their hair. Well, off. I was about to say, they, they got revenge in the end. <laughs> But the point is, really, either, both those programs either stayed flat or, in our case, gained viewers. Now I go to the other example I was talking about. We did a two-hour primetime special. It was our first event in the uh, the new Davis Arena, the new building that we had moved into. And How hard to get the network to give you primetime? Um, no, we had done it before when we were doing the Clear Channel uh, gardens shows before they closed the gardens clear channel radio was sponsoring it and wbki had just moved into the market we went on their air a month after they had debuted in the louisville market in may of 2020 or 2020 i can't even do the numbers now in may of 2000 uh so to have a program that was uh, that was immediately we were in in many cases cuz they weren't a powerhouse in the market they had a great schedule or a great signal rather incredible power over the air signal and full cable coverage but nobody knew who they were because it was a new station so we often became over the period of the 2000s the highest rated program that they aired on Saturday in any time period so the the sales guy came to us and said, hey, do you want to expand? We could do something. I said, well, yeah. 
if we can, how much would it cost? Because we were buying the time and then we turned around and sold sponsorships to air commercials, whether it be the satellite store, or whether it be the barbecue place or wherever to, to pay for the special and would then use that two hour primetime special on a Saturday night to promote the Louisville Gardens event that we had the following week that was being sponsored and paid for by Clear Channel Radio. And so, and we would still do our regular, we'd have our regular time slots. So on the times that we did the specials before the Gardens events, we would be on WBKI from 8 to 10 o'clock and then 11 to midnight. All that Saturday evening selling the Gardens event that Clear Channel Radio had bought from us. So it worked out good. But anyway, here's the numbers. In this case, we weren't doing a gardens event. We just were doing the bit. That was the time when we opened the new building that the competing fire departments, because we were on the line, one liked us and one was snotty. And we had so many people that we couldn't get in the building and they were in the parking lot and the buses pulled up and et cetera. And it was chaos. And the fire departments were arguing jurisdiction. And we had to close down for two weeks after that to take seats out of our building that we just renovated because they said we put too many people in there and redo the parking painting and all that other shit. But we drew it. We had like 1500 people in the parking lot live for this fucking taping and we can only get 500 in. So nevertheless, we did the same thing. We went to our sponsors, car lots, blah, 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 and said, Hey, we'll do a two hour primetime special. And you can be one of the title sponsors for X amount. And we were getting two hours of primetime television for like a couple thousand dollars, by the way. So on this particular Saturday night, and Kurt Angle was in the main event of the program. We had several of our luminaries back. But now we're fighting Saturday night primetime network television programming. This was September 7th of 2002. and we. I won't give you all the every single quarter because it eight it's redundant for the point I'm trying to make. But we started at a 0 0.7 rating, a 1.1 share. But by the second quarter hour, we jumped up to a 1.3 rating and 2.1 share. And we stayed between 1.3 and 1.5 with the shares ranging from 2.1 to 2.7 until we got to our main event where it was the Kurt Angle against, oh, God damn it. Who do you, was it damage it? Now I've blanked. What Hold year? On, let me, um, 2002. It may have been damage. It was damage. Yes, it was. Anyway, that was a 1.6 rating with a 3.2 share, which was the highest quarter hour is highest rating and share of the program overall we did a 1.3 rating and a 2.3 uh share and and in prime time let's say we did probably an average i don't have the homes here but let's say we did between 10 12 000 homes against prime time programming for a local television show that we had a production budget of 150 dollars on but we didn't lose the viewers You don't know what the, if it was just an average show or if you had a big main event on the other one, the one that was just a typical 11 p.m. show? Um, hold on here. Because um, the fact that each segment picked up viewers is fascinating to me. Okay. At that time slot. I just flipped pages. October 12th. Uh, overall, 1.2, rating 2.4, and the quarters were 1.0, 1.0, 1.3, 1.6. Um... If you if you could stop for a second, because one of the problems is there is not a wide availability of OVW TV out there. So there are plenty of listeners who have never seen what you call your best booking. True. When you talk about the ratings rising as the show goes on, how did you format the shows? Because this isn't just a one show thing now. This is two different shows you went to. How did you format the shows? What did you do so that people would want to be there at the end? It... <laughs> It was what they watched every week was a a standard 
pro wrestling program that could have taken place anywhere in any of the territories with modern, young, new talent. You start out, boom, with the audience screaming and somebody coming to the ring for your first match and the announcers are excited. And then during that first match, not only are you talking about what is going on in that match, but you're talking about everything else that's going to go on in the program tonight. And we're going to hear from the OVW heavyweight champion about what happened last week at, at Six Flags Kentucky Kingdom. And our main event tonight is going to be for the television title when so-and-so takes on such-and-such. And, such. and, and you're billboarding. And then by the time you get out of that, maybe you're going to a fucking VTR of something that happened last week on the program where you're going to get comments from somebody next or you're going to whatever the fuck. It's always different, but it follows a flow. I like to put a live interview in the ring in segment two because that way, especially if you're setting something up for later or just if you're announcing a main event match at a house show coming up that you want people to pay to see, then you get that out there so you can talk about it as much of the program as possible. And you've already had some action, so now they'll take some talk. And if there's violence or not in that live interview segment, you get out of that, you come back to another match where you can not only talk about what's going on in that match and, and what those people are involved in, but you can react to what happened in your live interview segment is how will that impact the main event tonight when the title's on the line? Or will it? Is it going to be for next Friday night at the Louisville Gardens, or blah, blah, blah. And then you've probably got another live match that you can stick in there to get somebody over before you do either another live interview segment. Remember, this is a hour program. You probably got either seven segs and six breaks or six segs and, and five breaks. So then you want to, if you've got time for your main event, you want to make sure to get that in, and, and you're either going to do your entrances and then say, we'll be back with the start of this contest in a moment, or you're going to start it, and the heat spot in the middle is going to be where you take a break when the baby face is in jeopardy, and it's cliffhanger as to whether or not he's going to survive, so they're going to sit through two minutes of used car lot commercials to find out whether fucking Nick Dinsmore is going to bleed out or not. And, but the main event of the program is always on last, and that's the big match, and that's the one where it's going to be two guys of the same level competing against each other or two teams. Some of the other matches may have been a big guy against a little guy in terms of either size or pecking order, but everything's going to be halfway competitive, and nobody's going to fucking go down without a fight. Just keep the fucking thing flowing. Is that, I mean, is that... No, it's it's obvious. I mean, that seems like that'd be the way to do it, but let's look at two examples, Roman Reigns and MJF, just because I think right now, AEW, you know, we talk about their star power problem. There aren't a lot of guys that you look at and say, people are really going to want to hear what this person has to say or what they're going to do. With Roman Reigns, it's been established, and we just went over the SmackDown ratings. People, a couple hundred thousand people tuned in live to see whatever he was going to do. With MJF. They've done a little better job, I think, the last few weeks, although one time they mixed up the segment order, I think, of the pre-tapes. Yes, yes, I remember that. It looked a little odd. But I feel like a few episodes recently, we've seen MJF, I mean, this past episode, opening match, locker room promo a little bit later on, later on he is involved again, but by the end of the show, he's a non-factor anymore. Darby Allen versus Samoa Joe was in the main event a few weeks ago, I don't think I, and I could be wrong because I don't have it in front of me. I don't think they picked up viewers. I think they lost viewers. That may be the kind of match that people say, that's interesting. I could watch that after the fact. I could watch it tomorrow. I don't need to see it live. Do you need to utilize a talent like an MJF or whoever else they could build up to that level, if they ever get CM Punk back, whoever it may be, and try to tease them throughout the show and save it to the end? Or should you... Is there anything that could be done right now to save the end of a dynamite? Or would you be wasting a top star to put them there until you establish to the fan base there's a reason to be there at the end? Well, you're going to, you know the old saying, you got to break some eggs to make some lemonade. You've heard that, haven't you, many times? Mama Cornette used to say. Mama Cornette used to say. <laughs> it's like gum and on a big about, boot heel. about chewing gum on a fucking <laughs> shoe. I don't know. They've established now they've trained the people. The one, uh, 
Again, the wrestling programs of old that I was talking about, Mid-South Wrestling or your local territory or the ones that I was booking that I'm talking about was responsible for, whatever. From the start, the people uh, came to understand that every part of the program is important. We're, we're going to try not to stink it out at, in any given point for you, but the best part's the last because that's the main event match. And whether it's, you know, the biggest stars or some sh something's going to happen, you, you knew that. And that's, not only was that, the the method of wrestling from day one because that was the way it was presented in the arenas and the main event always went on last because you know that's the thing that people paid to see and then you gave them a program leading up to that so it transferred to television it was done the same way but the the reason why they didn't try to change that that format or that principle or that rule of thumb was because that way when it came to television you had to sit through the whole show so we could sell you whatever the fuck. We could get guys over. We could show you new guys. We could uh, promos, whatever. You'd see all of that to get to what you were supposed to want to see. That's why you'd billboard the following week on Smoky Mountain Wrestling Television. Here's our main event next week. Tune in, folks. That's what, because that way, it was the spoonful of sugar that made the sales pitch go down, right? And that's why nobody in the, no wrestling fan that I ever remember in the territory days or my days of being a wrestling fan ever switched the channel on the show. I mean, there are the casual viewers and some people that maybe not switch channel, but just walk out of the room, which is why repetition comes in over a period of a few weeks, make sure they didn't take notes on every fucking point. Somebody had to take a piss. But when you started the wrestling show, you finished the fucking wrestling show because you couldn't wait to see what was going to happen. And you knew that, you know, chances are by the end of it, it's, it's something's going to take place. Am I, am I lying here? You know, I was just thinking as you were saying that as a kid watching wrestling, I didn't leave a show unless my parents said we had to go somewhere or something. Yeah, no, yes. Hey, Brian, house on fire. Just, just a minute. And a lot of those shows had no main events. I just had to see what was going to happen, what was going to be said. Plus, there was star power. And I think, you know, and again, you have to put in the, the equation the modern world, which is a lot of people are just going to watch what they watch on YouTube, or they're going to stream it, whatever it may be. But the network still cares about the ratings. And you have to care about making the network happy. The network wants that key demo, but they also want a show that's going to do well. There has to be a way so that people don't get run off that show every week on Dynamite. And we've seen here with SmackDown. Well, well that's, that's why I see you got to break a few eggs to break them of the habit. Uh, you've got to go ahead and bite the bullet and put some big stuff on at the end and make them wait for it. And some of them are going to miss it and they're going to miss it for a while. Cause now you've put them in a three year habit, but you know, I don't know. And Hey, I'm not saying I always gained list this one more November 30th, Thanksgiving weekend of, of what were we on? 2004. Uh, I did a 1.7, 1.5, 1.2, and 1.5 for an overall 1.5 rating and a 2.8. So I, my first quarter was my biggest. So God damn it. Holy mackerel. It can happen to the best of us. Quarter three was Linda Miles. So people came back for the end. No, I actually, <laughs> God damn it. I, she deserved a hash mark. But, uh, and that, but by the way, I was incredibly proud of never having gotten a hash mark, even on a Saturday night, 11 to midnight on the number five out of a seven station market. I never got a hash mark until fucking Heyman started booking OVW. Explain what a hash mark is. That is so low. It doesn't register less than a 0.1. Heyman got a hash mark. Yeah, but Heyman did good in the key demo. What's the key <laughs> demo of a hash mark? A fucking donut hole? 
All right, yeah. The, here, the key demo of a hash mark is a donut hole, and over there is their lead spokesman, the Invisible Man. All right, let's talk about SmackDown a little bit before we go. Uh, this was February the 10th, just this... It's fresh in our minds. That's why I'm looking at my notes so I can remember what I saw. Did you see Heyman's Al Capone suit? I think I've seen him wear it before, but yes. Oh my, it just, it was so bright and beautiful. He look if he had a carnation in his lapel and a fucking violin case, he'd be Frank fucking nitty. I, it's, he's such, he's such a heat getting personality. I'm, I'm captivated by Paul's work these days. So, Sammy's not here tonight, is what he's telling the people. He's in the ring doing a promo. And the people are not happy about that. And Paul knocks Sammy and a bit and then segues to Cody. And said, you know, Dusty raised an idiot for a son. Uh, it couldn't be more personal, playing on the, you know, you're making it personal line. And and Paul's the promo that he did made the title match important, the title important, and the title match important. They've still got two belts. It looks like Paul's, he needs to work on his cardio to be able to stand there under those two belts that long. Though I feel bad for him. I'm sure it's making his back bad. But as Paul's, you know, getting through the whole promo, all of a sudden, Sammy in a hoodie slides into the ring behind him and they do the fucking slowly I turn deal. And Paul's great. And they come face to face, and and Sammy's like, no, 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 I'm not gonna hurt you. And you know, he basically asked questions about the loyalty of the rest of the group, and blah blah blah. But he hugged Paul and told him to tell Roman he doesn't need to worry about Cody, just worry about him. So they're trying to build the the anticipation that Sammy is going to be the one to take the title from Roman at, at Elimination Chamber before Cody gets to him at WrestleMania. And maybe it was just me, and I'll, I'll ask you what you thought in one second, but I'm just going to say maybe it was just after seeing Paul and Cody on Raw and that brilliance and that, that promo that this one just was kind of, it was better than everybody else can do, but it wasn't great for these guys. What do you think? I mean, it wasn't Cody and Paul Heyman, but nothing's going to be. That was a very unique, even yeah. if they did something again next week, it wouldn't be the same. It was a very unique segment. I mean, it wasn't that, but I think it was fine. You had to get Sammy in the mix. You had to show that he was there early on if you wanted people to stay around at all. Yeah, no, I mean, they had to do it. I'm saying the execution of it, or maybe there, was, there, there wasn't there was a lot of zip. They could have maybe got to the point a little quicker. Or it just it, it wasn't uh, it wasn't the stand-up and fucking give them the standing ovation like Heyman and Sammy and Cody and these people have been getting lately. It was still better than everybody else, and I understood they need to impart the information. It just, it may, maybe now I'm just being hard on them because they've been so good. Yeah, I guess. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it was a fine opening segment, I think, for SmackDown. Or maybe it was just the rest of the program put me in such a bad mood. This was probably the highlight of SmackDown, now that I think about it. I was going to say they yeah. turned the things later on, but this was really all you needed to see. We're, but see, that's the thing. We're going, it's downhill from here, or uphill. or did, Have we ever established whether if it's going to get into the muck and mire, we're going uphill or downhill? I think we established it, but you've... Constantly, uh, uh, stubbornly refused. Yeah. The next match was Skid Row against Drew and Seamus. And now that remember, we've been talking about not only have they uh, obviously and blatantly given up on Skid Row, but that Flop Dollar must have gotten some kind of heat to the point where they're making fun of the fact that they're being buried. And the announcers are free to fucking joke about it as well. So they got the already in the ring treatment. They didn't even get the the rappers, the musicians didn't get their fucking music entrance. And I've got the flop dollar watch on now. I'm not talking about a wristwatch. I'm talking about it's flop dollar watch. Every time he's in a ring, I have to I have the morbid curiosity. I've got to watch whatever he does because there's never any telling what might happen. But apparently 
the agents and producers, whoever, have also caught on to what we've caught on to. And he was not allowed in this match. He threw a sucker punch from the apron. While he was still out on the apron and not legal in the match, old Seamus came over and gave him the 10 beats of the Bowery and added about an extra 22 to the point he was squirming trying to get away. So they're fucking with this guy. And then at the right before the finish, he ran in without a tag to take Drew McIntyre's Claymore kick because the other guy couldn't take both fucking finishes. And during this match, they beat up Adonis like a job guy, and the whole thing lasted three minutes. So, I mean, what else can you do to somebody before you tell them, please leave, go away, never come back? What is the fucking deal here? I don't know. What name do you think he's going to use in Impact or the NWA or MLW, wherever he's going to end up after this? I, th You know what? Tyrus. Tyrus needs to bring him into the NWA as his little brother. What's his name going to be, though? I said, what's his name going to be? That's the problem. Well, how about <laughs> instead of 50 Cent, how about 15 Cent? I'm just, I, I, I have nothing. I like B-Fab. I hope she stays. Well, I don't know. So then the Vikings got on the screen with a Viking video where they're Vikings. And Drew and Seamus ended up standing there staring at that. And meanwhile, in the back, Jimmy Uso still can't get Jey Uso on the phone. And it's 30 minutes into the program. That's all we've seen. I have seen, I shouldn't say seen, I have kind of noticed several segments with bonfires and helmets and these Vikings. And the point is, I have no idea what they've said in any of them. I haven't paid any attention. It just seems more stupid to me. It's not easy to follow unless you're up on Viking lore. Does anyone care about the Vikings? Only Minnesota. Anyway, we're 30 minutes into the program, and now we get Lacey Evans versus Carmen Harris. Now, I, I am a, a fan, again, of Lacey Evans, and she may be the best heel worker of all the way. She delights in being a bitch and the facials, and she's healing rough, roughhousing, you know, doing all that dirty wrestling. Carmen Harris, I've never seen a heard of before. She they put her picture in prison to cure the sex offenders. But she was just there to get Cobra clutched by Lacey Evans. But now that's three minutes or whatever it was. Okay, so now they're in the back again. And Jimmy tells Heyman that he can't get a hold of Jay, and Paul tells Jay or J Paul tells Jimmy that he was out there in the ring a few minutes ago being held hostage by a Canadian psychopath. Where, where was the family? Where were you? And he goes, well, I was looking for Jay. Jay's not here, man. So they're building up. Is Jay going to show up and support Jimmy for the tag team title match against Ricochet and Brown Strongman? And they still don't know. And there now the time has come for the match. And which, by the way, this was by far the match with the most interest in the whole program. But for storyline reasons, it had to go on. I don't know if it had to go on this early because there's a lot of shit afterwards. But so Jimmy enters the arena alone and then Jay appears in the arena at the top of the bleachers and comes through the crowd. And I think, again, I know this is great, but there's a huge Babyface pop from the fans for a heel showing up to defend and beat the babyfaces in a tag team title match. So we've got here this way. But 50 minutes, 50, 5 0 into this program, the bell rings on match number three after two three minute squash matches and some talk. So, again, this was, with a couple of bobbles, probably one, one of the better matches you've ever seen Brown Strongman in because this is the right, it's the right thing to do with him. Keep him on the apron most of the time because he can't sell. Give him a little buddy partner that is flashy and everybody will like and want to pull for as an underdog. 
and he makes the big comebacks and shit. And the Usos, they work hard and they've got talent. I, I think I would take them better visually if they had tights and boots instead of T-shirts, pleather pants, and tennis shoes. But I know that's the gimmick of the young folks these days. They tried to build a big hot tag for Ricochet to Brown, and they still didn't get it because even though they milked it and milked it so the people would understand it, when there was at, at the point that the tag was made, there was no way for the heels to prevent the tag, obviously and visually to the people before it happened. Therefore, you didn't get to maximum pop out of it. It was a foregone conclusion before it happened. Uh, Brown made the comeback. The Usos took back over. <laughs> Usos super kicked Brown into Ricochet that tagged himself back in, hit a press off the top and a couple of moonsaults. They had umpteen kicks and a couple more tags. Uh, finally, uh, Ricochet did the swanton off Brown's shoulders like last week, but slightly less stiff than the last one, which looks like it looked like it could have paralyzed Imperium. And Jay pulled Ricochet off the cover. And so Brown went around to do the choo-choo. At least they don't play the choo-choo train noise anymore, thankfully. Uh, but Vince Jay plays it when he chases the paralegals around his desk. Well, yeah, around the desk. Choo-choo, choo, I'm coming. Choo. And then he says, open the airplane hangar and let my plane land. And then Jay ducked Brown and he choo-chooed over the desk. And he was out of the way, and then Ricochet had to potato somebody, so he hit a potato shooting star off the top rope on Jimmy, but then he bounced off of Jimmy, and Jay came off the top rope and safely splashed Ricochet, one, two, three, and that was a heck of a look at exchange. Because Ricochet, he hit that poor fucking Uso with that shooting star with full weight, but he bounced beautifully and got into position wonderfully. So that was pretty good match. What'd you think? Pretty good match. I mean, the story was about the Usos, and they kind of got past it so you could focus on the match pretty early, and good match. I mean, I'm not the biggest Braun Strowman fan, but I like the way they've used him, at least with Ricochet. When he's in a tag match, you see less of him actually doing shit. And he does try to work the people. You can, and he's got, you know, he's trying to make faces. It's just the problem is the one he's got to begin with doesn't lend itself to any it, well nevertheless so, so then after the break the usos were in the back where jay now has told jimmy that he doesn't know whether he's in or out of the bloodline he's always going to be jimmy's brother but he doesn't know he's in or out of the bloodline he doesn't know we found out you could see just barely that Heyman is lurking like a fucking combination of Alfred Hitchcock and the Fernwood Flasher behind a pillar in the corner of the uh, of the building, and he hears that. And then when Jay walks off and Jimmy stand there, then Paul comes up behind Jimmy and says, "Hey, was that your brother? Yeah. Did he say anything? No, he didn't say anything. He just left. So now Paul knows. Oh, see the intrigue here. Now here the." <sighs> We've established at this point that even the most intelligent people like a Paul Heyman in this world of WWE and wrestling in general in modern times will have personal conversations and exchange information about criminal activity and or secretive behavior with a handheld television camera five feet in front of their face. But boy, these guys are all doing this stuff well. I'll say that for it. But then, speaking of not doing things well, I, I love her and her family, but Natalia's in the ring doing a promo about the women's elim elimination chamber, which I don't really care about, and then Shayna comes out, which I don't really care about, and they argued, and then Ronda came out. And Ronda came out with extra dark raccoon eyes, um, I'm still not sure what that's supposed to be, but basically they beat Natalia up and Shotzi tried to make a save, but <laughs> didn't make it. And Rhonda judo threw everybody and the baby faces rolled out to the floor and sold the end. Did I describe that correctly? 
Yeah, I wasn't uh, really into that segment. So back in the parking lot. They've made me not want to see Ronda Rousey anymore. Well, yeah, I mean, at this point, what, what the fuck's going on? But back in the parking lot, where the, all the action takes place at the wrestling shows. It used to be true back in the 80s, but nevertheless, Jay and Sammy are back in the parking lot. Sammy's in the hoodie. They're in between the semi-trucks. They can't be seen. Except by the cameraman. Who's right Except by the cameraman five feet in front of their face. Broadcasting this to a national television audience. Sammy tells him, Roman's not going to let you forget about what you did the way you stood up for me at the Rumble. You know that. I'm eight days away from getting rid of Roman, Jay. I don't want you to have to go down with the ship. And Sammy says, I acknowledge you. And, and they fist bump. And that you can tell that means something to Jay, that he got acknowledged. And then we got Chelsea and Cruella against Raquel and Liv for three minutes. So, again, except for the Usos tag match, there's been no serious match on this program. This whole show is about one storyline. That's it. Yeah. At least it's the one they care about. But Michael Cole sat down with Charlotte about WrestleMania and Rhea Ripley. At, on the sit-down interviews, the crowd noise underneath, I think, is distracting because they're, they're trying to be serious and professional and look like they're on 60 minutes and the crowd noise. It's not like they're, they're up and yelling like they're on the back. And it, yeah. Anyway, Charlotte's well-spoken and believable and can't wait to see the match, but nothing happened here. And then the main event was a winner gets an intercontinental title match next week on television match. Karrion Cross with Scarlett O'Hara against whatever the fuck his name is, Moss, with his girl Emma versus Pablo Escobar with Zelina versus Rey Mysterio with the four sisters on Thumb Street because he has no woman, he's all by himself. But no woman, no cry. No woman, no cry. He's not crying about it. Well, he's only got one eye. Oh, I forgot it grew back. It's a man's world, but it ain't nothing without a woman or a girl. This is a man's world. It's a man's break. Is that your James Brown? That's my James Brown. Jesus. I don't want to hurt. I don't want to hurt myself. I don't want to hurt myself. Uh, it's it's actually a commercials world. Basically, they this is the main event. The entrances started at nine thirty five Eastern, and the bell rang to start the match at nine forty four Eastern. <laughs> And then they went four minutes in the actual match and did a couple of dives and went to the break. And they came back from the break and they went a little while longer. Scarlet tripped Rey Mysterio and Cross knocked Mysterio out from behind with his cross elbow or whatever. And Pablo Escobar tried to cross body Cross off over the top rope, but Cross got stuck and Pablo went over the top, but Cross rolled out underneath, and then Moss, who I thought was a baby face and is apparently being presented as one, dropped an elbow off the top rope on Rey Mysterio and beat him one, two, three. So the finish was a baby face beating another baby face that had been attacked from behind and fucked or over by the manager and the heel first. So that makes perfect sense. And then we get the, the main event interview segment is, did you have any comments on that? I wasn't trying to skip ahead of you. No, actually, after... Is this where you went to sleep? No, after Sammy and Jay had their thing uh, in the back where they ran into each other, I decided to leave the room and I never came back in the room. And then, unfortunately, someone erased my DVR recordings of SmackDown, so I didn't get to see the rest of the show. I don't know what the main event was. That may have been the, your internet service provider in your walls. No, I don't think it was that. They don't want you to see this. Well, well nevertheless, you, you didn't miss much because the main event bloodline segment was basically a cliffhanger. It lasted about 60 seconds, and it was Paul Heyman in the back with Jimmy Uso. And he's got, a, he's got his phone, and he says, I'm just on the phone with Roman. I'd put, I'd put him on with you, but no reception in this room here. He says, this is his instructions, next week, Instead of going to Montreal, 
he wants an on television perspective. So we need the Usos to stay home and watch it on TV. And Paul says, because sometimes you see things on TV that you don't see live. And then he walks and then Jimmy's there going, oh boy, uh, maybe he knows something. You said next week. Is the pay-per-view next week? Yes, it is. Holy shit. Wow, that was fast. And also, wow. I don't think the Usos can go to Canada, can they? <laughs> I think you figured out what they're doing, actually. I didn't even think of that. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Well, there you go. And I, I mean, boy, and boy. That's how you can defeat Roman Reigns. Get him in another country. Those Canadians are strict. If, if the WWE, a $6 billion company, can't get the goddamn hottest story they've had in years all into Canada because of a DUI, those Canadians are sticking to their fucking guns, pal. Well, it may have been more than one DUI. Well, any kind of DUI. $6 billion ought to get you... Hey, we'll wrap this motherfucker up in cellophane and fucking carry him by hand to the building and then dump him back across the border when we're done with him. Here's here's 500 grand. But anyway, that was, uh, that was SmackDown is what that was. Let him into your country or Andy Gibb gets it. Andy Gibb is dead. No, that's right. Wait a minute. I was I was thinking of uh, fuck. What the fuck? Andy Gibb is goddamn. I not know he's Andy Australian. He's from Australia. I was thinking of fucking what's his name? Alan Thick. No fucking. Andy Griffith. No. Rock uh, me gently, Andy Kim. Andy Kim. Yeah, he's Canada. Rock me gently is a very underestimated fucking hit. It is because most people think it's Neil Diamond. Most people hear that and think it's a Neil Diamond song. No, nobody. Yes, they do. They absolutely do. Oh, for heaven's sake. Who who does not know in the world that Andy Kim is the one who did Rock Me Gently, Rock Me Slowly, Take It Easy, Don't You Know, that I've never been loved like this before? I think there are plenty of people who don't know the song. And if they heard the song, they would think it was Neil Diamond. Well, I I think they'd be mistaken and I think they'd be idiots. I think they'd be the, 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 the sum total of ignorance. I was told years ago, I don't know how true it was, but I was told this at Sony. They said, if you ever want to make Neil Diamond mad, ask him about Andy Kim. So obviously he thought he was stealing his gimmick too. He looked nothing like him. He totally stole his sound for that fucking song. Come on. That doesn't sound like a Neil Diamond song. It sounds nothing like Sweet Caroline or, or fucking We're Going to America or all those other fucking songs. We're Coming to America? Coming to America? Going to Is America? It weird? We're Coming to America was Eddie Murphy. Yeah. We're, they're coming. How, what does he say in that fucking song? I don't know. I think he's a little pompous. He's a pompous ass is what he is. Neil Diamond? Yeah. Why? Because he's, he's mad at Andy Kim. The guy had one hit. All the hits Neil Diamond has had. And, and fucking Andy Kim had one hit. And Neil Diamond begrudges Andy Kim is one fucking hit. You know who he has no problem with? Andy Kim. That's because he's from Australia. And he's dead. And he's dead. And so is this show. So is this show. Boy, howdy. That, that <laughs> escalated quick or de-escalated quickly. It submerged past us before we knew it folks we're out of time we should have said that quite some time ago thank you fuck you we'll see you next week bye bye everybody